Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting for the Arlington Select Board for Monday, March 29th, 2021. As a preliminary matter, this is John Hurd, Select Board Chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Yes, thank you. Steve DeCourcy? Yes. Len Diggins? Yes. And Dan Dunn? Yes. And staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdeling? Yes. Doug Heim? Yes. And board administrator Ashley Marr is participating remotely. Good evening. This meeting of, of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth, given the outbreak of the novel coronavirus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirements of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Even if members of the public do not provide comments, participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. For this meeting, the select board is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak. In order for us to recognize speakers appropriately and develop accurate minutes, it is helpful for our participants to see your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. All the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on the Novus Agenda Dashboard, and we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus, unless the chair notes otherwise. We're now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, wait till the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If any members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to, your, to identify yourself. This meeting will feature opportunities for public comment on certain agenda items. After members have spoken, I as chair will afford Public comment opportunities as follows. I will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. Please keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. If I can say that next week without reading it. All right, that takes us to our consent agenda. Item number two, minutes of meetings, February 22nd, 2021, March 21st, 2021, March 8th, 2021, March 15th, 2021, March 22nd, 2021. Request for contractor drain layer license, Marky Paving, Inc. David Markey, 110 Middlesex Street, Chelmsford, Mass, 01863. And for approval, LGBTQIA plus Rainbow Co Commission banners. Lisa Krinsky, co-chair of the Rainbow Commission. So first of all, Mr. Dunn, remind me, were any of these meeting minutes were you not a part of? So the first one is actually where I was appointed. So I, um, and so I was out of the meeting for a few minutes, but I still feel equipped to vote on it. Okay, thank you. All right. And do we have a motion to approve? Move approval. And I don't know if anyone, yep. including someone from the LGBTQI 
A plus Rainbow Commission is here. But move yep. approval. Move approval in the second. Second, and it does look like uh, Lisa Krinsky is here. And Ms. Chaplin, is Ms. Krinsky with us? Yep, she should be coming on to the screen shortly. Hi, thank you. Hi, you can just identify yourself and tell us a little bit about the banner request. Sure, I'm Lisa Krinsky. I'm the co-chair of the Arlington Rainbow Coalition. And uh, we are requested that in the month of June uh, that we are able to put up our pride banners in the center of town. We have uh, had 10 of them last year and we'll have an additional six for a total of 16 this year. Thank you. And I'll turn to the board for any comments. Mr. Dunn? No comment, happy to support. Thank you. And Mrs. Mahan? Same as Mr. Dunn and happy to support. Thank you. And Mr. Diggins? I am thrilled to support it. And, and, and uh, the, the new banners you know, are, are great. And if you could say a little bit about the, the new design and, and, and who um, designed it, because I want to give them credit. Oh, OK. So um, <clears throat> uh, we had um, uh, uh, one of our community members who uh, took the logo and the design that we had from last year and just sharpened it up a little bit, made it more visibly appealing. Um, and are able to use that new design on the uh, on the new banners that we're creating this year. Yeah, well, thanks, Adam, for putting it up. Bede. And I have to say, oh, I mean, thanks. I, yeah, I, I, I and, and each of the the, um, the little um, beams, I mean, uh, is has a, a special meaning. Bede. And I don't know if that's going to be on the Rainbow Commission's site. I I can't remember um, from the meeting whether we decided that was going to be the case. Bede. But, but um, uh, they're not just random. I mean, there's some meaning behind them. And yes, they, each, of, each of the rays represents a different part of the LGBTQIA plus community. And I think that on our website, we'll have some more detail about each of those individual flags, but um, wanted to include that in the overall. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, and, and they were so impressive uh, last year. Hey, they really make a statement when you walk down uh, Mass Ave uh, towards the center from either direction. Hey, uh, they, they really are impressive. So uh, I'm really happy to support it. And I also want to say that I really enjoy being uh, the liaison to uh, the commission. The meetings are always um, fun and enlightening. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, they are. They are. We're happy to uh, have you with us. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, so yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no questions, and um, I'm happy to support as well. Thank you, and always happy to support these the banners. It really you know, gives a lot of color, and it's, it's mm -hmm. really great to see them up and down Mass Ave. So, all right. So we have a motion to approve the consent agenda that's been seconded. Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Thank you, Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you, Ms. Kurtzkin. Thank you very much. Happy Pride. Almost. <laughs> All right. And that takes us to traffic rules and order and other business. Item number five, select board handbook. Mrs. Mahan. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, after our esteemed colleague, Mr. Grilly, who worked um, so diligently on the select person handbook, um, I had initially embarked on um, civil public discourse um, and introducing that to our meetings. And then our then colleague, Mr. Carroll, asked to, to sort of champion that, and he did. And with his exodus, I have picked that back up again. So uh, what I'd like to, and I'm not sure if we should take a vote on this tonight. Um, I'd like to if we could, but if we don't, that's okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what I did was I attended a Zoom meeting with the um, MMSA, Mass Municipal Association of Select Board, a uh, uh, course on uh, public civil discourse, sort of carrying on that uh, discussion. And from that, um, I think there were like 59 or 60 different cities or towns that participated, whether they were select boards or city councils. And quite a few points came up that I think we should consider and or vote on or discuss and vote on in a future meeting. Um, after the meeting, I did 
I like to prime myself on my memory and I had a, a brain block. I called our town manager to say before we that I attended this meeting and I said, I don't know if you know anyone over at MMA that can help me get some of the follow-up information through Isabel Nichols. Um, that was spoken to and cited about, and, and he reminded me he is the MMA president. Um, got me that information within the hour. So, um, what I'd like to do with the select board handbook is one of the points that really was salient to me that was raised at that meeting of all the different um, city councils and town select boards, and some are still board of selectmen, is that um, there are at least a half a dozen communities that, and I think this is a good idea, that when um, people take out uh, paper to be on the select board or the city council, along with everything else they get, they get the, in our case, uh, select person handbook, as well as um, a signature page that says, I have received and reviewed the select board handbook, and then some cities or towns um, don't have that signature page for the whole handbook, but they definitely do for the code of conduct. Um, and the discussion that came out of that was um, having a civil public discourse, but you need to start in your own house first. You need to have codes of conduct amongst your board of council that you ascribe to. So, um, I think that's a good idea. I think it's also a good tool for any chairperson of Arlington Select Board to be able to say um, that any current or new member of the Select Board, uh, this is something you, you reviewed and you signed, that you have reviewed that. You can still ignore that and not decide to um, align yourself. Mrs. Mahan. I think the box that your gut is tapping the microphone. My boxes? Yeah. yeah like when you're moving. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. It's oh, covering the microphone. So, so what I'd like to put forth tonight is that um, I think it's a good idea to, not currently, because we already have candidates for select board, and I don't want anyone to think anything untoward that I'm saying any candidate uh, for election or re-election there's anything untoward towards them, but that um, what I'd like to do is hear from my colleagues if a motion would be appropriate to um, adopt that uh, following April 10th, any member of the select board um, who will receive or has received uh, a copy of the select board handbook which includes a code of conduct signs that they have um, reviewed that. And then going forward, when you take out papers, at least for select board, and it was also su suggested that this should perhaps go to other boards, commissions, committees in the town um, who have the sort of same parameters uh, also do the same. So I'd, I'd like to hear from my colleagues and I don't know that I'll make a motion right now because maybe it needs to be a future select board agenda but I think we, we should um, uh, take a motion now or some other night that uh, as of April 10th, any member of the select board uh, or any current member uh, signs that they have received and reviewed the select board handbook, which includes the code of conduct. And then moving forward in the following year, any person who takes out papers for a select board that's not up for re-election, which means they've already signed it. Um, when they take out their papers, they get a copy of that. And it, it sort of equates to you're applying for a job. You'd like to know what the job description is. The select board handbook is a lot of what the job description is. So I'd like to hear from my colleagues if you know if anyone's in agreement either tonight or a future night um, to uh, take a vote that uh, on April 10th any member of the board, all members of the board uh, within the next meeting, um, uh, signs that they've reviewed and re they've received and reviewed the select board handbook. And then going forward, 
any person running for election, not re-election, because you've already seen it and signed it, any person running for election receives a copy of that and signs that they have received it and they sort of understand the, a tacit job agreement to that. So that, that would be, I'd like to make that motion, but I want to hear if my colleagues say they need more time and they'd like to have the vote at another meeting or if everyone's comfortable tonight, if we can take it tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jacosi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd second Mrs. Mahan's motion, and and I'm I'm fine with that. I did. The only thing I would suggest is maybe working with Attorney Heim, if we can just come back with language as to where this is in our Chapter Four of our Select Board Code of Conduct for a final vote. But I I think that the concept makes makes good sense, and I, I certainly could support that. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Yes. I'm fine with it too. And as long as I, I there's a rule that the guys have to be as dapper as the current chair or Mr. Corsi, I'll be able to adhere to it. <laughs> Mr. Dunn. Uh, definitely. Um, I, I, I certainly have no problem with signing it. I think it's a fine document and it's something that I think that we, you know, certainly in the past we worked a lot on. And I, I feel like that that process of working on the document is more important than the signature, but uh, I don't see the signature as a problem or a distraction. Yep. Yeah, and I'm happy to also support that. I, I think it's certainly reasonable to provide the, the handbook to people right when they they express interest in being on the board to see what, what because uh, there's certainly some useful information over there that's been compiled over time. So Mrs. Mahan, was that a motion, just to clarify? Um, it, yes, it was. It was to um, by Mr. Corsi. what you have stated, and then moving forward, if anyone takes out papers for select board who's not up for re-election, because you've already signed it, yep. and, and it just because you signed that you've received and reviewed it, doesn't necessarily agree that you're, you're in agreement with the code of conduct. It's, it's just saying that you've reviewed it. But it's a, hopefully a tool for any future chairperson um, to kind of remind someone of the job description, but also giving them their uh, right to uh, conduct themselves as a select person as they see fit. Sure. Attorney Heim, do you have any questions on the motion or do you have what? No, I, I think, I, think yeah. I understand the, um, I, I think I understand what, what the, what, what Ms. Mahan Mrs. Mahan is asking, I think I understand the input from the board in terms of um, what I would be expected to do to help, so. Okay. Yep. All right, with that, we have a motion to approve, seconded by Mr. Corsi. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Janice vote. All right, thank you. So that will take us to warrant article hearings, articles for review. We have article 21, article 7, article 16, article 23, and article 81. We are taking article 21 first at the request of the proponent. So if we have Mr. Sambo Matsu and Ms. Kiesel with us. All set. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Thanks. So um, this is Article 21, and I actually have a clip that I wanted to play. Um, first, I want to just talk for uh, really quick, but is it OK to share my screen after I just give a quick gist of the article? Yep. And if you could just say your name for the record, then we'll have yeah. Mr. Chapter link can allow that. Yeah. It's Laura Kiesel, I live at 260 Mass Avenue. Um, so this is Article 21 and this warrant would endeavor to earmark the majority of the funds for the <laughs> Affordable Housing Trust Fund to go to households making at or under 60% area median income. So just really quickly, I think it's great that last fall during um, town meeting, an uh, Affordable Housing Trust Fund bill was passed or warrant was passed, but I know that there was an amendment to align the language of defin 
uh, defining affordable housing with community housing under the CPA. But my concern, and I know others share this concern, is um, the language of the CPA that defines community housing allows households making up to 100% area median income to qualify. Uh, to put that um, into plain language, 100% area median income, I believe, is about $83,000 for a single family, um, $95,000 for two family, and $107,000 for a three family household. Um, so if I could share my screen, I thought I'd play some clips um, from the town's own housing panels. Okay. I'm not seeing screen share, do I? Ms. Chaplin should be able to share. Let me try a different way. It says photos, but I don't see anything that says screen share. Okay, let me try one other thing here. Okay. Does that show it? Let me see if it'll let me. Let me just try. Can you see my screen? No, we just lost your video. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm not seeing screen share. I'm seeing uh, website URL, box, Google Drive, Dropbox, but it's nothing that says share your screen under share content. At the, the, and you're looking at the Zoom window, Laura? Yeah, I thought you just hit share content, right? And hit screen share. Because I've, um, I've- Laura, is there a way you could send me the link? Because I seem to have screen share privileges. Oh, you do? Hmm. Apparently, apparently. I feel like it might take up a lot of time to get my other computer up to send it. Um, so I, I can try if, but then I guess I'll just talk for a couple of minutes while I'm trying to send that because it's going to take a minute or two. So, um, as I said, 100% area median income, that is uh, $83,000 for a single family, $95,000 for a two family, and then $107,000 for uh, a three family. And my concerns with that is that if you look at the area median income by race in, in the Boston metro area, the area median income for white households is actually quite close to the 100% AMI. It's uh, $85,000 for a single family, $94,000 for a two family and so on. But if you look, if you um, desegregated it by race, um, black and African-American households here in, um, in the Boston Metro make $47,000 AMI and Hispanic households make $42,000 AMI. So if we don't um, more intentionally um, have a mechanism in the affordable housing trust fund to compensate for these disparities. My concern is that this is going to work against trying to make Arlington a more diverse town. And it's going to be by proxy exclusionary to, to many black and brown people. Uh, likewise, uh, that very high AMI is also very exclusionary to people who are in Section 8 vouchers. And Section 8 vouchers are also disproportionately comp comprised of people who either are people with disabilities or black and brown people. So what, that's why we were hoping to actually get a mechanism implemented into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund that would make sure to earmark a majority of that to um, lower income households. And I know that some of the concern was about having so I just sent it to you, John. Did you get it? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. But I needed it says I need uh, access. Permission. Yeah, it says you need permission. I just yes, I just sent that request. Okay. Um, so let me just send it to you. So I just shared it. Do you have it now? Yes. Okay. So I was when you're done, I'll, I'm happy to, I'll try to share my screen here with the community. Yeah, so, um, so I know that some of the concern was we needed to have some flexibility for higher income households, I think maybe for purchasing options for homeowners. So that's why I feel like this might be a compromise to earmark the majority. I know we suggested a range of 75 to 85%. Um, so it's not completely excluding some higher income households, but that's, that's the gist. So I don't know if you wanna play it now, John. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a try. 
Okay. All right, everybody, here we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Oops. Okay. And when, you know, one of the questions were, uh, when we're talking about defining affordable housing, Arlington has battled for a long time about misunderstandings around what affordable housing is and what that term means, especially as it meet what it means in terms of compliance with 40B in Arlington, what that means about building up or building out. And so if one of you all can sort of answer, answer some of those concerns, because we're getting a lot of questions about that. I would speak to that's a larger challenge for a lot of a number of cities and towns and 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 I think as cities that are committed to centering racial equity in as part of the frame I think the question of understanding what affordability is um, does require you to use a lens that maybe redefines affordability um, you know and, and so one example for instance with one city um, as, as many know that affordability is usually based upon the uh, AMI, the area, um, area of median income. And so in one city, the area, and, and, I, and I appreciate the data that was shared earlier by Manisha, the area median income in this city was very similar. It was over 100,000 uh, um, median income. And then when they started to disaggregate it by race, which is so important if you're centering racial equity, they started to realize, well, when you look at the median income for whites, it was about 80,000. For blacks, it was uh, for Hispanics, it was fifty-five thousand, and for thirty um, and for blacks, it was thirty-five thousand. And so, when they looked at their policy in this city, they realized that affordability was defined at eighty percent of AMI. Well, if you look at eighty percent of AMI, eighty percent of one hundred thousand is eighty thousand. So you are acknowledging that if you have a challenge on an off of a data standpoint, it shows racially that. Latinx communities and Black communities um, earn much less than that. Well, on you're about seven and a half minutes. I about policy Give me extra time. Is, uh, coming up with a How long is the video that you're trying to share? And so, the, in this the case, the example, almost, uh, the, the video is less than four minutes, uh, Mr. Hurd. Okay. Is that is that all right? Yep. Maybe we, yep. You can finish this video. Thank, and then thank we'll you go very much. Forward. Yep. Thank you. The that the city by using a racial equity lens create a policy that uh, then set policy where there needed to be X percentage of affordable housing for people that were in the 30 to 60% of AMI, 60 to 80% of AMI, as well as under 30% of AMI. So acknowledging there was more intentionality about the policy, so you're not reinforcing the inequities. Um, and so that's just a great example for me of why data matters, getting that data, and what it means to be targeted. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that targeted universalism. How are you targeted in your process as you have universal goals of making it more affordable for everyone? Just what we are considering to be affordable. Um, I know in Boston that most affordable housing is at 70% of the area median income. And for one person, that's about $68,000. Um, that is not affordable for, the, for a, a good chunk of Boston. So if we're calling that affordable, then it's really going to leave out a, a, a large number of folks. And we know that that means black and brown folks. It's one of the things that people are very afraid of 40 Bs. And yet 40 Bs, 25% of the units mm -hmm. would have to be affordable. And if the town wanted to, they could re, um, really insist that the affordability be at 60% instead of 80% or 100% of median income, or even lower. Um, you know, that's, that's something that the town could actually take on. Okay, thank you very much for letting us play that. Yep, All right, so I'll turn to the board now for any questions, comments, or motions. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But, um, so, um, I guess um, the AMI, it's, um, it's questionable as to even whether that's a good metric itself, right, um, Ms. Kizel? Yeah, it is, it, is, it is questionable. I mean, there's pushing to, to not look at AMI, but right now that's, that's what is used. So there's a push to try to 
you know, have a concerted effort to go to lower AMI to actually compensate again for racial disparities and to also make it eligible for people who are um, voucher holders. Right. I mean, but I mean, but the the perhaps the concern is that the AMI is still underestimating I mean, the uh, the 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 cost, right? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. You know, so I'll tell you where I am on this. It, it, um, I have a lot of confidence in Ms. Kelleher, Karen Kelleher. It, uh, it, she works in this area a lot, me, and then I've worked with her. Um, I've learned a lot about um, housing uh, from her and, and, and the groups in town that work with her. And, and, and I also understand me, what happened because I was there, what happened in town meeting uh, last, uh, in the special town meeting. And it, I have a lot of confidence in me that the trust, the board of the trust fund is going to do all it can to make sure that as much housing as possible is affordable uh, without me perhaps reducing the amount of housing that is created. It, now, Admittedly, I, unlike transportation, I have a very good grip on aid. I am still navigating the, the waters of housing. Aid, and uh, my inclination now is to support what Ms. Kelleher has presented aid, and see what comes out of the, the board of the Affordable Housing um, Trust Fund. Uh, I would not like to tie their hands at this point in time, uh, because as I said, I, I feel confident that they are going to do all that they can to increase the amount of housing, which may very well do what you want uh, to do, maybe even go further. Hey, so um, I'm gonna hold off on making a motion now because I really wanna see what my colleagues have to say. I don't wanna force anyone's hand at this point, but I think you see the direction in which I'm headed. Uh, so if you wanna make a comment based on what I said, I'm um, happy to listen. Sure, thanks. Um, so I, I hope, I, I hope I do have confidence that everyone has good intentions, but I know, I mean, I used that last clip from Pam Hallett, who's my landlord. I live in affordable housing and I've almost been priced out of Arlington despite living in affordable housing because the AMI is so high here. But I know she was talking about 40 Bs and I think it's peripheral to the issue, but I know that there was some idea of using the affordable housing trust fund to fund the affordable housing in 40 Bs. And those are often 80%, 100%, I think some of the newer ones that are being proposed are about 80% AMI, and that's also exclusionary um, to black and brown people. If you look at the AMI, that's still like $67,000, I think, for a single family household. That's still something that I could never access as a voucher holder or any of my neighbors. So I still, that's why I put that last clip in, because even if we're going to use it to 40B, I think that we as a town need to say, well, can you make those 40B affordable housing units actually at a level that those people on vouchers and those people most in need can access it? Because I don't want, um, you know, the same way single family housing has become a proxy for exclusion, the high AMI becomes a proxy for exclusion. So like Leon Andrews said, um, from who I believe is the National League of Cities who was consulting with the town is you have to be very intentional um, that program you talked about and actually say, we're going to earmark X percent for the lower income people if we wanna look at this through a racial equity lens. So I actually <laughs> took inspiration through that. Can I, may, can I add to that, Laura? I mean, one thing that we, we haven't emphasized that we really should is class diversity, which is lacking in this town. Now, uh, many people I think who are listening into this this uh, Zoom broadcast will remember that, that Arlington was a working class town for a long time and it was possible for working people to own their own homes here very proudly and then give them to their children. That is, those, those days are gone. Uh, white, poor, poor and working class white people also don't, can't afford uh, housing. It's, it's, it's a class issue as well as a racial issue and it's a justice issue. Um, I personally would qualify, barely, but I would qualify for affordable housing under this 100% AMI. And, uh, and I'm a tenured professor at a private university who can barely, I'm barely clinging to my apartment here in Arlington because it's, my rent's doubled uh, in the last 10 years. But I should be last in line 
not first for affordable housing. It's people who are struggling, people who are on the verge of homelessness, people who are holding down uh, possibly, you know, two jobs, uh, who can't afford medical uh, care. We have a national crisis, a global crisis. People are being shoved onto the streets. This community needs to respond to that urgent need. And that means to make housing affordable for people who are in that income bracket where they're struggling. That's different. Of course, I, I would like to see all housing uh, in Arlington affordable for everybody, including people like me. But this, this is, there's a very specific reason we're asking to lower the, uh, the recommended AMI, and that's why, for justice and diversity. Well, thank you very much. I am resisting being asking a bunch more questions about what fundamentally is the issue um, with affordability, uh, but perhaps sometime uh, we could have a conversation because I really would like to discuss that with both of, with both of you and other people who are uh, concerned, including myself, I mean, about, about poverty really what is what it comes down to I me mean, and um, the distribution of, of wealth. Uh, so thank you very much. Attorney Heim, did you have something to add? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to uh, highlight one thing because I think that this is not the focus of the proponent's article per se, nor is it the focus of uh, the select board's discussion, but I know that 40B is a tremendously important in town. I just want folks to understand that the ability to negotiate the affordability of a 40B is not something that we can regulate in a bylaw. It's something that happens in the 40B process. So the whole point of 40B is to circumvent local zoning and uh, town bylaws on most things. You can seek waivers and the uh, Housing Appeals Committee basically assesses things. It'd be very hard to assess a specific bylaw with respect to the percentage of affordable units, but it is something that a zoning board has authority to negotiate if they want to negotiate as a um, order of conditions uh, similar to or analogous to orders of conditions in other zoning matters. So I just want to let folks know that you, the zoning board currently has the authority to negotiate affordability rates for units um, as part of an order of conditions. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. DeCorsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the, the, thank you for the presentation. I just wanted to clarify one point. When I first saw the Warren article, I thought that you had intended to include um, any appropriations or any, any grants from CDBG or CPA. But when I heard your comments, uh, Ms. Kiesel, at the beginning of the presentation tonight, it seems to be just geared to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Am I, am I right on that or? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the focus of our emphasis. I think technically the, right now the language is broad and it says the, you know, the majority of affordable housing funds um, but that's what we are emphasizing is the trust fund. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. So I, I, I am, am with Mr. Diggins on this and, and I, I do want to say for at least with respect to CDBG and, and CPA funding, at least during my tenure on the, on the board, all of the grants have been to properties um, where th that, that would be considered low at, uh, below 60% AMI. And then that would include this year what the grants were to the housing corporation and, and clearly a lot more to be done. But I, I, to the extent that you were addressing CDBG or CPA, I just wanted to make that point. But one thing Ms. Kelleher, Kelleher said at the town meeting is distinguishing between having priorities in the short term through a trust action plan and having language in a bylaw. And, and so, what she said that I found compelling was that in, in the short term, when we get an action plan from the trust, I think it certainly should be a priority um, to, to address it below 60% or, or, or below, but because it's so difficult to amend a bylaw in, in, in terms of timing, in terms of what opportunities come up, her recommendation in town meeting agreed is, is that bylaw should be as flexible as possible. And I, and I do note that the trust fund bylaw was just approved recently by the attorney general's office. I think the trust it's, the trustees will populate um, or, or will be selected sometime in May. And, and I think it's really incumbent as part of that process when they come back with a declaration of trust to see what their recommendations are in the short term and, and to see um, how, how that fits. So for the 
um, for the, the need to be flexible in a bylaw, I, I think at, at this point I'd, I'd be inclined to, to not support uh, a change to any bylaw, but I, I certainly respect where you're coming from here. And I think it is something that we should be focusing on um, without the, the, the specific language uh, um, amending a bylaw. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would um, sort of piggyback on Mr. DeCourcy's uh, comments that he just made. Um, I know town meeting debated this vigorously and Ms. Kelleher um, did speak to the trust, the Community, Community Preservation Act, and um, anything else that um, lies before that. Um, I think this is a good discussion that we're having, but there's a lot of questions that I have from the proponents um, that aren't really answered, and maybe we can talk about it in the future um, regarding um, Time frame of spending this the funds and 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 where that goes, but I think town meeting had a very vigorous debate um, with Ms. Kelleher regarding the affordable housing housing trust fund. I know that Aaron Zerko and Jenny Rate presented to the finance committee, uh, as well as we have the board of trustees action plan. We have a lot of things in place, um, and we we can discuss modifying those in the future but um i really don't this sort of seems to me to um kind of be rudderless in terms of um what it is we're being asked to do but besides sort of muddling the waters of something that we voted at town meeting um and uh one of the first tasks for the board of trustees that miss uh kelleher uh, presented to us was identifying affordable housing priorities um, in the town alongside and establishing rules and regulation um, of the trust on, under a trust action plan. So I'd like to, instead of slowing that down or stopping that, move forward on that. So I would recommend no action and encourage future discussion on this, but I would recommend no action. So then. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I so I definitely uh, I want to I have several points. <laughs> uh, I'm really glad that uh, Laura and John that you brought this forward. Um, I agree that affordable housing in Arlington is a huge issue. Um, if you you may remember ten years ago when I first ran for selectman, I said the most important thing in front of the town at the time was health insurance. And we made a huge because of the cost was growing like eleven and fifteen percent a year, and we made huge improvements on that. And then five years ago, I said the most important thing was the budget and getting through the override because we wouldn't be able to get, you know, ha have our teachers or our services or anything like that without the override. And then about three years ago, I started saying that the biggest problem in, face in front of the town was uh, the cost of housing. I said that the changes in the town and the price of it. And so I, I don't, I, um, I want to, I, I want to be upfront that I agree with you. But the, that it is a huge problem and it's something that we need to, uh, to, uh, continue to work on in a bunch of different ways. Um, so that was my first point. My second point was to talk about the Arling, the trust fund and how it's envisioned to actually work. It, the trust fund as it's currently envisioned isn't gonna be a vehicle for collecting a lot of money by itself. It will collect some money, but it's not gonna have a bunch. What it is, it's gonna be leveraging a lot of other sources of money, including the CDBG and the CPA. And with, uh, I mean, in community development block grants and the Community Preservation Act money. And those, those monies come with strings attached already. That if we attach our own strings to them, we lose a lot of access to that money. And so, and uh, to me, I would say, I don't want to cripple our access to that money um, unnecessarily with a, with, a, with a restriction that's written into the bylaw as opposed to an intent. Uh, my third point is about that we just don't have the trust fund commissioners yet and we don't know what they want to recommend. Actually, we know a lot about what they want to recommend, but I think we should let them do their work. That's what town meeting said to do in November. And I think that we, like, I don't, given that the town meeting set that course just back in November, I don't see a reason to change course um, without new information. And we just don't have uh, sufficient new information. And I actually was struck by one of the things that came up in the, in the video you played, um, 
the gentleman from the uh, League of Cities, Leon, he made a, a really strong point about making a targeted, thoughtful choice about what affordable is. And I think that that is exactly the right advice. That really rings true to me. And I want to do that in this trust fund commission with these commissioners. I don't want to try to do it on the, uh, on the floor of town meeting. Uh, and my last point was just in regards to the 60% versus 80%. One of the things that I would keep, and I know you weren't proposing to strike 80% entirely, but just for the, I just don't want to be clear that one of the reasons I support some funds being going out at 80% is workforce housing. Because I look at the, um, I look at our teachers, our DPW workers, our public safety workers, and I want to make sure that they're not priced out of town. And uh, I think that we should be supporting a mix of housing at a variety of levels. And and and, uh, and so um, I, I I'm I'm certainly still listening and still talking, but I'm um, I'm definitely inclined to to I, I'm not inclined to make a change in the town meeting and excuse me in the trust fund uh, at this point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I want to thank you both for bringing this forward. I, it certainly is the right sentiment. And I think the hope with this vehicle, once it's created, is that it will operate within the parameters that you're proposing and try to cr help people that are in the 60% AMI range. Um, but like my colleagues, I think at this point, you know, we need to implement the vehicle do what we can to try to fund the vehicle and then see what good we could do and allow the trustees some discretion to make sure that, that they can do the, the most that they can um, with the, the new trust that's created. Um, I th like Mr. Dunn said, I think Mr. Andrews from the National League of City Cities advocated to first create the vehicle and then study the data before mandating how the funds can and cannot be used in order to maximize the amount of benefit they can create from the trust. Um, so I think like my colleagues, I agree with the sentiment and I think this is where we hope that the trust fund will direct the majority of the funds. But at this point, I don't wanna tie the hands of the, tru of the trustees. Um, all right, and with that, this is a public hearing. So if any members of the public would like to speak, please use the raise hand function on your Zoom application. So the first person that we have here is Rebecca Gruber. All right, Ms. Gruber, if you can just say your name for the record and you have three minutes. Yes, Rebecca Gruber, Pleasant Street. Um, I'm speaking tonight on behalf of Envision Arlington's Diversity Task Group as its co-chair to voice DTG's support for this Warren article, earmarking the majority of municipal funds for affordable housing, including those in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to households making at or under 60% area medium income. On March 8th, the DTG voted unanimously to endorse this warrant and we urge the select board to do the same. Housing affordability is an emergency and Arlington needs to be doing more. As a matter of social justice and equity, DTG believes it is paramount that affordable housing funds go to those house households most in need. Currently households making up to 100% AMI can qualify for the funding. However, that 100% AMI is approximately double the AMI of black and Latinx households and this warrant article would address that disparity. By setting such a high AMI for affordable housing, Arlington is setting an exclusionary bar for many people of color, people with disabilities, and other marginalized populations who qualify for affordable housing. A high AMI is potentially a form of redlining, an historical policy that resulted in de facto housing segregation. The Diversity Task Group supports Arlington's pledge to work on rooting out systemic racism in all areas, including housing. To achieve our goal to make Arlington a place for people of all backgrounds and abilities, we need to support this article to make housing more affordable for those who are most in need of it and who have historically been most deprived of it. 
Thank you for your attention. This is on behalf of the Envision Arlington Diversity Task Group. Thank you. Thank you. We have Eric Pohl. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You just say your name for the record. You have three minutes. Eric, Eric Pohl. I live at um, 285 Mass Ave. Uh, thanks everyone for your time. First, Mr. Dunn. Um, I don't know many of Ms. Kiesel's neighbors, but the ones I do know, they're painters, they're nurses, they live in affordable housing and their workforce. I ask you to please correct your statement um, because Workforce housing implies at market rate implies that affordable housing isn't workforce housing. And I think you claim that market rate housing was workplace housing. Um, just now it's all, it's recorded. Um, so I do know that folks that live in affordable housing are the workforce or they're disabled or elderly and they don't have um, means or access to to join the workforce in the way that I do. Um, and um, you know they they require special special help or to save them from homelessness. Now, um, democracy has been said to be two wolves and a sheep fighting over what's for lunch, and um, and I know that you're asking that the trust the trustees do the right thing, keeping housing under affordable housing under 60% AMI. That's a lot of trust for the sheep, um, given the amount of affordable housing that's actually been created over the last decade. So I also ask that you try to meet your constituents in person, the folks that actually live in affordable housing, find out what they do, find out their circumstances, and how much trust they should have given the amount of affordable housing that's actually been generated over the past decade. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yep, you can respond. Yeah, I just want to briefly say, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Pohl, but I think you must have misheard me. I, I was saying exactly, I think, what you were, which is that, uh, that, that affordable housing efforts are necessary in order to have workplace housing. And I want to enable the Affordable Housing Trust to do that work. That's exactly what I want them to do. Thank you. We have She's Judith Garber. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you see Hi, any, your record? My name is Judith Garber. I, I live up Massachusetts Avenue. Um, so a lot, a lot of different things to think about with this. Uh, I appreciate you all considering this. Um, first, so I, I, what it seems like is a, I've heard a lot about in housing that this seeming trade-off between building more and building affordable. If we wanted to feel affordable housing, we're sacrificing building more is what it seems like. And I understand that trade-off when it comes to, I, I understand how, how the trade-off works with the way that building works and development works, but this is our affordable housing trust fund. It, it seems very strange to me to put it, you know, the AMI as high as 100%. This has to be really, that we have to really make a concerted effort to make this actually affordable. And even 60%, I was just looking at this, um, this uh, resource from the Arlington's 2018 Housing Forum, and it said on the on the waitlist on out of the 700 people on the AHA waitlist, the vast majority make forty thousand dollars or less, and 55 percent make twenty thousand dollars or less. So you know we there's a lot of people that are waiting for housing and need housing, and by you know I, I know we want to be flexible and all that, but I I think we really have to set some kind of limit. And I, I also don't think this is super radical since there was an amendment exact, there was this exact amendment also proposed at town meeting. So I know there are a lot of people, town meeting members that were for it. And I think it deserves um, additional discussion. Um, so thank you. Yep. Anna Hankin.
Hello, um, Anna Hankin, Marion Road. Um, I also wanted to speak in support of this. Um, the There's not just the ability to afford housing, I think, that needs to be considered. There's also the amount of rent burden that a lot of people end up with when they try to rent somewhere that's really, really expensive. And that rent burden prevents them from spending their income on local shops, buying groceries locally, being able to support the economy of the town, pay local wages. Um, and when you are not prioritizing those people who end up with the highest rent burden, the highest percentage of their income devoted to rent rather than their necessities like food and um, medications, you really prevent people from being able to support the town and without being able to have a economically diverse set of people supporting the town's economy, it kind of starts to collapse. It actually happened in my hometown. Prices inflated. They didn't prevent the inflation and people couldn't move in. People who retired couldn't retire there. Shops shut down because no one was living there anymore and no one could afford to shop. Um, and the town kind of died. Um, and a lot of studies show that these kinds of economically diverse communities are much more healthy economically. And also the children in those economically diverse uh, communities tend to have higher academic scores, more positive academic outcomes. It's really important that we prioritize helping people not just afford to live, but participate in Arlington. Um, and I think this would help do that. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Heaton. All right, Mr. Heaton, can you hear us? Mr. Heaton? All right, Mr. Chaplain, we'll go to Mr. Kaminsky and we'll check back with Mr. Heaton at the end. Sorry, I didn't realize I was oh, muted. Oh, sorry, I can hear you okay. now, yep. Yeah, hi. Can you I say your name for the record? Kevin Heaton, I'm at 252 Massachusetts Ave. I'm also in affordable housing. Um, I wanted to support uh, the housing warrant just to bring more, uh, bring in more affordable housing. It's also it's also been endorsed by uh, all of the disability groups around here, like Boston Center for Independent Living, Disability Policy Consortium, Mass Adapt. Um, and and also by it's also been endorsed by City Life Vita Ivana. It's like the big like the biggest uh renters advocacy group in Boston. And the Mystic Valley and WCP, Boston Tenants Coalition, and like I said, all the major disability groups in the area. So, and I think it would really help bring more um, diversity and more, more affordable housing to the town. And we're lagging behind in some of the other towns around here. Thanks. All right, thank you. And we'll go to Mr. Kaminsky. Can you hear me? So you can, if you just say your name for the record. Yep, my name is Jonathan Kaminsky. I live on Randolph Street in East Arlington. Uh, in the history of affordable housing campaigns in Massachusetts, and I've lived in various places all over the states, one of the constants that I've seen time and again is that um, whatever well-intentioned laws are passed, um, actual implementation tends to fall to stall tactics. Um, that 
uh, small government committees, not unlike this one, find ways to stop the well-intentioned laws from actually being put into practice in a way that improves the equitable intention or in the way that actually makes good on the promise that the law tries to make. Um, what you've been asked to consider is not itself binding. It's to bring this before town meeting. The actual decision would be made by town meeting, by a representative body elected by the people of Arlington, rather than by a small commission that controls the Affordable Housing Trust. And putting this decision, putting this decision of cutoff, I respect the need for more data. I'm a scientist, I always respect the need for more data. But putting this decision entirely in the hands of a small unelected commission instead of putting it before the town meeting just strikes me as another way of avoiding making it actually happen. Um, and so I would encourage you to approve this, whether or not you think it will actually survive town meeting, because I think that this is not a decision that should be made behind closed doors. This is about the fabric of the town. This is about who can afford to live here. And this is something that I've seen time and again, that this will get referred and stalled and stalled again and stalled yet a third time. And 10 years later, we'll look back and say, whatever happened to that affordable housing thing? And why is it all going to people who don't actually need it? So let's take the opportunity now to take some initiative, put this before the town where the decision can actually be made. And if we need to change it later, we have a process for doing that. And it's no harder than the process you're looking at right now. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just two points um, regarding uh, before a small group of unelected officials, we are all elected by the entirety of the town. Ms. Mahan, um, I, was, I did not include the- I, I'm sorry, I'm not, asking I'm, sorry. For, I'm not asking for a back and forth with you, yep. honestly. Um, uh, and that just threw me off on the second point um, uh, regarding town meeting. So unfortunately, um, the previous speaker interrupted me and I lost my train of thought, but there, oh, my second point is this being discussed behind closed doors or uh, that's not the case. If it was, uh, you and other speakers would not be aware of it and we would not be having this discussion. So I, I take um, uh, issue with uh, this being voted on by a small group of unelected of officials which we are elected by the town and this being discussed behind closed doors. I, I think we need to stop some of that rhetoric that seems to be permeating this and other discussions. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to do that. All right, let's continue with public comment. Mr. Hamlin. Hello, can everyone hear me? Awesome, so my name is Guillermo Hamlin. I'm of Massachusetts Avenue as well, and I'm here speaking in support of this. I wanna thank the select board for considering this measure. I understand that it's very weighted on many different sides. And I believe that it seems to be leaning no action in regards of its recommendation to the town meeting. I'd like to echo the previous point, not all of it, but enough of the point where I believe that a lot of your insight will be recorded I believe the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and their trustees and the managing trustee have a lot of work to do. And I agree that we don't wanna limit them in their ability to be able to make sure that we have permanent affordable housing. That being said, I believe it's very helpful as a, you know, to predetermine and make it very clear what the cost of admission is for developers here. So I'm asking that we support this measure, support the AMI to make sure that there's permanent affordable homes and offers and solutions for those below uh, the 60% AMI. I understand that you can proceed with no action and town meeting can continue to do their thing. I think it would be nice to have the select board support behind this. I understand that there's a lot more to be understood. There's a lot more to be discerned. I believe that by town meeting, we can have more information, but if possible, I ask that you vote in the affirmative to proceed, to recommend it, um, and then we can, you know, knives out at town meeting. Thank you. All right, and our last speaker, Ms. Dre.
Hi, good evening, Elizabeth Dre, Jason Street. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of this Warren article. Um, I'm struck by the language of, of hoping and believing. Um, when you're in an emergency, when you're in a, a fight, a battle, you don't use hope and belief. You bring tools, you bring actual concrete solutions to the table. And um, I'm always heartened when I hear people talk about how much they support affordable housing and building affordable housing. And it's the crisis, as Mr. Dunn said, that the biggest crisis that we have. Yet, when people bring forward these small pieces of solution, whether at the, at the ARB or through through at the select board, through warrant articles, they're they're just pushed aside because none of them are big enough to be the solution, right? Um, but if we really, if we really, if it it is really the crisis that. I believe it is, and Mr. Dunn believes it is, and many people in the community believe it is, then we need a we need a battle plan. We don't need hope and we don't need belief. We need a plan. We need to cobble together small pieces from lots of different areas to get it done. Um, we need concrete steps. Um, and I also want to say that I believe Mr. Kaminsky was probably talking about the trust fund committee as being an unelected group and not referring to the select board. I may be wrong, but that was what I inferred from his comments. Um, and I would also like to dispel the notion that this trust fund was debated vigorously at the last town meeting because it was not. It was actually stunning how little conversation there was about the trust fund and these amendments. And when it passed, I think a lot of us had, were just left in shock that we had passed such an important thing, an important bylaw without a robust discussion. So I really think that if we're, if, if we're serious about it, then we need to do something. And I think why the heck not start with this proposal? Thank you. Thank you. So that closes our public comment portion of this hearing. So I will go back to the board for any questions, comments, motions. Mr. Diggins. Well, we do have a motion on the table uh, to for for no action. As far as I know, there isn't a second, right? Not yet. No. I have Not yet. So I will second it. You know, uh, because he, uh, he, I, I do have confidence I mean, in the folks in town that are working on this issue and they care about this issue and that will um, help to choose the members that will be a part of the board. Uh, so anything else that I would say at this point would just be repeating on what I've said. I've heard from my colleagues uh, and I've gotten insights from what they've said. Um, I've heard from the um, people attending the hearings and um, once again, going to second the motion for no action. Mr. Corsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no further comments. Hey, Mrs. Mon. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to say to, not to my colleagues, because you all know this uh, ad infinitum, but uh, to everyone who's uh, attended our meeting here tonight, I grew up in what you would consider in Arlington affordable housing. I grew up in Monotomy Manor. My family were low income. Um, I lived that journey. Um, and, and in terms of the speakers, I'm not saying that one or two of you haven't, but I don't think you even came close to the experience that I lived in, in terms of uh, going to Arlington Public Schools, living down in Monotomy Manor, uh, receiving the block of cheese that wasn't cut. So it kind of reminded you how poor you were, as well as other things. So I really take issue with um, a minority of the comments uh, in terms of you haven't lived the experience that I did, as well as um, maybe unfairly uh, that I am offended by uh, some of the excursions a cast to myself personally, because I've lived this this road and I've walked this road and I, I've done everything that's been a driving force of me getting into public service. So um, 
you know, I, I didn't live on Jason Street. I didn't live on an apartment on Mass Ave. To me, that's, you know, uh, elegant living. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to point that out because I want to let people who are speaking to this let you know where I come from because that's where I came from. I came from, uh, we didn't have Arlington Eats back then, but there was sort of a composite of it that, that came to that. I, I've walked this road. I've lived this road. I could not afford to, or my family could not afford to live on Mass Ave in an apartment or anything like that. So um, I definitely understand uh, the issues before us and how we need to reach that constituency. And, and I understand that other people may live in, you know, million dollar neighborhoods. And I'm not saying your experiences which can equate to where I come from. Um, but I, I, I'm really a bit offended by uh, some of the comments that were directed tonight. So thank you. This is done. Um, I guess just a couple technical comments. I just want to, uh, a couple of, one of the speakers definitely said it already, but I wanted to reinforce it. That, so what were the vote that we take tonight isn't about whether or not it goes to uh, town meeting. It goes to town meeting no matter what. It, when it's on the warrant, it goes to town meeting. Uh, what we're talking about is what the recommendation before town meeting is, and that's a significantly, a significantly different thing. It isn't that we're, it isn't whether or not you block it or not. It's about what the rec attached recommendation is. Um, and the second thing I just wanted to say is that I've, a repeated theme that I've got heard is that like the, the is that is fear that the uh, trust fund is go or the, excuse me, trust fund excuse me, the the the, the it, it's going to um, be creating housing that's at 100% AMI or near 100% AMI. And if I thought that the trust fund was going to be doing that on a regular basis or even at all, I would be uh, I would be much more worried and looking to make a change. But because but as I said in the beginning, that the trust fund is going to be in particular leveraging money from CDBG and the CPA, and that money doesn't move at 100%. It moves at mostly at eighty percent, and actually, sorry, mostly sixty percent, and sometimes eighty percent. Uh, and so, I just, I, I don't feel that I don't. That's, I just wanted to clarify. That's what if, um, that, that if you think that we should be doing this because you're worried about fund housing being created at one hundred percent AMI, I'd say the good news is you don't have to worry about it. It's not going to be happening with this trust fund um, as a matter of practice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I would just add that, again, I think with the comments that the board's made is that not that we don't think that this is a good article and a good policy, it's just we don't want to get ahead of the actual trust. We want to look at the data and this could be something that next year we come back with or the year after to create a policy as to how the trust fund funds are allocated. But we want to create the fund first, let the trustees operate the funds, and then we can come up with a mandate on, on how they can spend the funds. Um, so with that, we have a motion for a new action, which has been seconded. Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Five zero vote. All right, thank you both. All right. So that puts us back into order here. So we have article for review, article seven, bylaw amendment, rock removal requirements. Mr. Chair, if I may? Yes. So this article comes before the board uh, with the consultation of this department, inspectional services, the health department, um, the town manager's office, uh, as well as the fire department. The one of the, the most persistent complaints that, that we've had over the last several years has been use of rock chipping as a means of uh, excavating uh, lots, uh, usually of, of a significant amount, at least the, the, to the extent that we're talking about ones with complaints. Um, and the town hasn't really had a lot of great tools to address this sort of public health and nuisance concern in the sense that obviously it's very disruptive to people living nearby. And uh, what inspectional services reports is that 
uh, builders are oftentimes reticent to uh, assess whether blasting might be a much faster um, and less disruptive option because they have to get a survey done by a certified geologist, which costs, costs money. And at least in inspectional services point of view, they oftentimes underestimate the amount of time and shipping it's gonna to take to excavate a lot. So we've had a lot of these situations where uh, neighbors have complained about the noise, the health department goes out, but uh, they can only uh, under our current bylaws really monitor the uh, noise level. Uh, they can't address all of the other concerns. This bylaw is a moderate uh, incremental step. Um, I wanna be very frank with the board. There is some legal risk involved. It would essentially require uh, folks who wanna excavate, excavate more than 50 cubic yards of basically bedrock is what we're really trying to get at. It would require them to do a, bla a, a, a blast survey and essentially evaluate whether or not blasting is feasible. It would not require them to necessarily engage in blasting. Um, there are lots of reasons why that is a more legally tenuous position. Um, it may in fact be possible, but I think this, this bylaw proposal in itself is kind of pushing the envelope a little bit far. And I, this is something that's very important for me to note for the public, but I think the board understands this. There's a very specific reason why uh, we're allowed to uh, engage in a bylaw like this, uh, which I've highlighted in my memo, which is that there's a general law that authorizes us to regulate um, earth removal more so than um, uh, other subjects of, 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 of bylaws um, so that you could really uh, have more of the building process uh, contingent upon this. And we have another article that's sort of talking about the building process later. So I just want to make that clear for the public that there's a specific statute that authorizes us to seek bylaws to regulate this type of thing. Um, so. Uh, if you have questions about how it would work, I'm happy to answer them. But um, conceptually, again, it's trying to address a problem that's been a long-standing um, sort of nuisance that's somewhat created uh, by a real estate market that makes it feasible, uh, more more financially feasible, to excavate um, some of these lots than I know that all the board members have heard about. Thank you. Turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions, Mr. Dunn. Um, I think that this is a, I, I'm really glad to see the collaboration and I'm really glad to see the approach to something that has been frustrating people. Um, I'm happy to move approval. And Mrs. Mahan. I know people have questioned my head nodding, but I will second that by nodding my head. Mr. Diggins. Just a, a quick question, Mr. Heim. Um, so blasting is allowed now though, right? I mean, they just have to do the survey I mean, themselves, they have to pay for it. So I, I wanna, yeah, thank you, Mr. Diggins. This is a very good question. Um, you can blast now. And there actually have been several projects uh, that inspectional services highlighted for me where uh, the blasting regulations were, were, were followed. And what resulted was a much faster and much less disruptive excavation process. Um, there are really extensive blasting regulations. And the fire department actually oversees blasting to make sure it's done safely and attached to the select boards, to my memo to the select board, there's just a pamphlet that highlights some of the things that have to be done. There are gonna be circumstances where blasting is not feasible because of you know basically the findings of that pre-blast survey or where it would pose too much of a risk to um, uh, abutters. But in most cases, the blasting has gotten to be so precise, the technology behind it is so, uh, has such precision uh, that, that those things aren't issues. But, uh, but, but other things that folks just should know for general knowledge, uh, if somebody does blasting, they have to be bonded to make sure that they can compensate for any damage done uh, to anybody's you know, neighboring foundation or anything like that. Uh, for the most part though, the fire department reports that those are not issues that, that the uh, blasts that are done in Arlington have done very successfully. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, um, so I'm just trying to get a, a handle on, on some of the complaints that, that we've heard about in you know, the blasting that has occurred. Do we have any, any kind of record of how much 
how many complaints there have been, me, uh, what kind of damage may have been done, me, uh, what kind of compensation may have been given. Are you asking me, Mr. Diggins, about blasting complaints or rock chipping complaints? Uh, blasting complaints. Blasting. So I, I could definitely uh, follow up with the fire department on that. I'm not aware, after having spoken to Chief Kelly, of any complaints about blasting um, or, or folks who you know were detrimentally affected by blasting. And again, this bylaw would not require someone to do blasting. You can already blast right now. Um, it would require somebody who wants to excavate more than 50 cubic yards to consider blasting by doing a pre-blast survey instead of just uh, assuming that uh, the more economic and better way to do it is rock chipping. Yeah, no, just, I, I got some feedback I mean, about people who did exper experience me. So, oh, okay. Yeah, well, yeah I, so that's why, yeah, so it's not, Purely theoretical, although I do tend to ask those purely theoretical questions. Uh, but uh, so that's where I was coming from with that. All I right, thank you. Sorry, sorry, sir. I can certainly find that. I can get that information for you. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. DeCorsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, yeah, I support this as well. Thank, thank you, Attorney Heim, for the detailed memo and, and the candor in terms of the extent of the um, of the statute and, and, and what's going on here. And, and um, I had some questions for you earlier that you had answered and, and I appreciate the consultation with the, the other departments in town. Great, and yep, I think this is pretty straightforward. Um, this is a public hearing. If anybody wishes to speak on this article, please use the raise hand function on your Zoom application now. All right. So if we can promote Ms. Suko Bijowawa. Hey, if you can say your name for the record. Yes. Um, uh, this is Mitsuko Fujiwara. I live in Stony Brook Road. And um, I don't know if you read the uh, public comments on this topic, but uh, I live near 25 Brunswick Road, where blasting has been going on for about four months uh, in my neighborhood. And um, it doesn't mean I, that I'm for or against this amendment per se, but um, there has been a lot of negative consequences of blasting and um, the, there's been issues with blasting that are not addressed by the Massachusetts regulation. And I would like to know if these issues can be addressed by the town through bylaws or other means, if you're going to encourage blasting. And the other question I have is um, if the town thinks that there will be more or less extensive excavation in the residential area if this amendment is passed and the town's reasoning on why there will be more or less because that affects the people living nearby blasting. And thank you. Attorney Heim, are you able to answer those two questions? Sure, so um, with respect to um, I, first of all, I appreciate uh, the comments that have been submitted that, 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 that not everybody's, well, let me put it this way. The, 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 for example, I know that one comment was concerned about uh, the pre-blast inspections that are done to abutting houses and um, what the purpose of that, that is. Um, so the purpose of that is to be able to assess whether or not there's any damages. This this bylaw is not necessarily um, proposing to change. Well, it isn't change, proposing to change anything about the state's blasting regulations, which again are, are pretty extensive, and are supposed to require that anybody engaging in blasting is bonded so that they can financially compensate anybody who has a claim uh, through their insurance company or anyone else, or, or, or directly uh, if their homes are damaged. Um, so. Uh, this isn't proposing to change anything in that regard. Um, I don't think that we could change the state laws blasting requirements um, without 
a lot of thought about what would have to be done to keep that from preempting uh, the state law. That would be tricky if the board wanted to do it. I know that I know that there are towns that have gone in the converse direction more historically than recently and have uh, prohibited blasting uh, entirely. Um, so uh, it is something that the board could consider under another warrant article. I don't think the scope of this is big enough to change the way or locally regulate the way blasting is conducted. The only sort of thing that this bylaw does is say you have to do a pre-blast inspection consistent with the requirements of the law before you engage in excavation. It doesn't tell you that you have to do blasting. Um, and it may be that folks who are butters um, urge folks under this under our good neighbor agreement not to do blasting. You know, they would prefer rock chipping, but at least it would be a more informed process rather than assuming that that the chipping is is an improvement. It is, is a better way to go. Chaplain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and just to Mr. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Fujiwara's question about more or less development uh, based on the potential adoption of this bylaw or bylaw amendment. Um, I, I really see it as neutral and town council can tell me if he disagrees, but I see this as um, developers are already um, have already and will continue to identify parcels that are legally developable and what this would allow or what this would mandate is a more thorough investigation of the means by which the property could be excavated. I don't believe that adoption of this bylaw would make it um, any more easy or less easy to actually excavate and develop. It would just further um, sort of further in intensify the investigations that need to be done before chipping or blasting decisions are made. Thank you. All right, and we have one additional public commentator, Ms. Dre. Hi, thank you, Elizabeth. Hey, name again for the record. Elizabeth Dre, Jason Street. Um, and I'm here as a town meeting member for Precinct 8, where some of this blasting is currently happening on Brunswick Avenue or Brunswick Road, which um, four different abutters submitted letters um, sort of of concern. I don't know what's, you know, what the way to go is. I just want to really elevate these concerns to you um, that I'm hearing from people in the precinct. Um, part of the concern is that there seems to be like a 30 day time that um, you have to report damages to your foundation within and that might, uh, doesn't seem to be enough time for long-term sort of damage to settle in. Also, uh, people have reported that their basements are now flooding because the um, the blasting um, changes the water and 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 where the, how the water goes through the rocks, and so that their their basements are flooding. But they might not know within that 30-day period until there's a big rain. So I want to put that out there. Like, is there a way to protect the abutters and people in the neighborhood who may not, uh, the damage may not show itself until uh, much later? Um, also about the notice. So what kind of notice are the, um, is the contractor have to give the, the, the the, the neighbors um, before, before they blast, right? Um, I read, I've spoke to a neighbor who says that they, they don't hear the alarms and suddenly, you know, their dog hears it, but they don't. Um, so I'm just wondering, are there way, things that, that can be put into this to sort of be more protective and more favorable for the abutters who don't have a choice to have to live through it, but can protect them? Thank you. Yep. Trinheim, are you able to answer those questions? Um, I can answer uh, some of them. Um, so uh, I think that the, uh, the, 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 the that's correct, that you have generally under brass blasting regulations, there's a 30 day period um, to do an inspection 
and determine whether or not there's been any damage so that you can basically uh, file a, a claim. That's, that's, that's correct. Um, there are regulations with respect to um, the, both the warning sound that has to be uh, emitted when folks are ready to blast. Um, there are limits on uh, the vibration and noise that can result from a blast. Um, and uh, there's a couple of different steps set forth all again in state law for um, a regulatory review by the fire department um, if there's uh, damage that occurs. Uh, I don't, I think that I, I'm glad to hear all of these issues. I think it's important uh, to have them be raised overall um, in terms of this specific site and whether or not these things are sort of more representative of blasting. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head whether or not there's um, more discretion for us to do something uh, about it in the immediate term. If folks are concerned about, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that I, I know what exactly can be done in the immediate term. There again, there's there's such extensive regulations that they have to look at some of these issues a little bit more specifically with respect to notice. I mean, a lot of these things are going to be subject to um, the good neighbor agreement generally, um, but uh, depending on the site and, and germane to the water issues, um, we've just discussed uh, the stormwater management bylaw reform, which I can speak to the town engineer and the environmental planner about a little bit more in advance of town meeting if folks would like or in advance of your uh, final vote and comment to get a little bit more information about how do they assess stormwater within the context specifically of lasting because we spent a little bit of time a few weeks or last week uh, talking about uh, MS4 permitting and some of the other things that have to be done and the way in which they're trying to address uh, stormwater uh, issues that come out of project uh, uh, site development or site redevelopment. So I, I can look into those issues more, but I, I don't think I have a satisfactory answer right now about, you know, the, the water infiltration issue. Um, and I, I, I do think that I can certainly look at, you know, what local blasting regulations we could impose on top of the existing state law scheme. But some of the issues that it sounds like are being raised here are, are pretty specific maybe to this project. If there's supposed to be a warning horn and it's not loud enough, it's not necessarily that the regulation isn't there, it's that they're not, it's, I mean, it sounds like they're not following that regulation and uh, there may need to be a uh, follow up on that score. All right, thank you. Okay. And thank you, Mr. Eck. So that will close our public portion of this meeting, of this, yeah, this meeting, of this, hearing. All right, and I'll go for the board. Any final comments? Mr. Dunn? No, thank you. Ms. Mahan? Mrs. Mahan? No, thank you. Mr. Diggins? I'm all set, thank you. Mr. DeCorsi? Uh, yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just briefly, and, and this, maybe when we come back for final votes on this, Ms. Dre brought up the point of a 30 day notice period, maybe we can just verify that there's not a, a discovery rule uh, in, in, in that that um, would allow people additional time and, and they don't want to conduct a ton of research on it, but I, I, maybe we can report back on that when we come back on final votes, that, that, that that's all. I Attorney Ham, we have a motion to approve that's been seconded. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. That's a good point about uh, latent uh, conditions. Um, on the motion, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Thank you. 
All right, and that brings us to Article 16, Bylaw Amendment, Pre-Construction Rodent Survey and Pest Management. Do we have Ms. Crowder with us? Yes, we do. Hi, if you can just say your name for the record and tell us Hi. about the Warren article. Um, my name's Elaine Crowder and uh, Precinct 19, town meeting member. Um, and I'm bringing Article 16 before the board today um, about pre-construction rodent survey and pest management. And basically the issue that I'm trying to address is um, the, the situation when construction is happening in town, um, digging starts and rats are disturbed and spread to neighbors. Um, this is usually a very distressing situation. Um, it, it's something that, uh, that where, where uh, neighbors then feel the need to uh, do some kind of remediation, which might involve poison. Um, and there are, of course, ramifications from that of um, increased poison in neighborhoods can then affect other things like uh, prey animals and food chain. So, my first goal with this in proposing this is to promote sustainable development, which would maintain the health and well being of neighborhoods that are hosting construction projects. And in some ways, sort of a, a focus on this idea of the neighborhoods actually are hosting the construction project. And so there is an aspect of, of the good neighbor agreement um, in this. The second is. Uh, second goal I have is to promote uh, as much as possible integrated pest management solutions um, in town as uh, as a way of approaching this particular issue. Um, the central tenet of integrated pest management is to choose the least toxic product that will be effective on a target pest. Um, so the proposed, my pr proposed strategy is actually to seize the opportunity that we have during construction to, uh, to actually, often many of the construction projects are at a place, at a point where they are no longer inhabited on a continuous basis. Um, and uh, at that point, that it, it's sort of a perfect opportunity to apply solutions to boroughs on the property. Um, I've had the experience living in a condominium of dealing with a very, very large rodent population that have of about 2016 or so around a dumpster and had the opportunity because there was a window of in which pest companies were using dry ice to treat burrows to realize that treating burrows with dry ice is something that um, is extremely effective, uh, much more so than um, baiting and uh, in terms of the numbers of rats that can be um, eliminated at one time and eliminated to the extent that you don't really get repeat populations in, in, in and around that area. So it just seemed like a perfect opportunity to um, promote in town um, more use of these kinds of integrated pest management solutions before construction happens. Um, so the proposal itself is basically a survey 
proposing that survey the property be surveyed before construction, that uh, the intervention happen before construction, and that there be a report that says uh, that there is no more rodent activity on the property. Um, and this is all achievable because when you use something like dry ice in burrows, um, the typical way that pest management companies uh, test for rodent populations in that situation is they, they'll uh, cover up the burrow entrance and if they don't reopen, then, um, then there, there are no, is no more activity. If they do reopen, they retreat um, for a period of three days or so typically. And then uh, the population has, has been abated. Um, so one of, one of the uh, interests for the town, I, I mean, for neighbors, for the abutters, I think is that they are aware that this kind of thing is going to be happening um, on construction that they are abutting on property that is that that is going to have excavation. Um, so I'm proposing that there be an additional element of um, alerting the abutters through the existing communication channels for uh, the, the good neighbor agreement that this uh, abatement has occurred and, uh, you know, sort of the results of the reports that have been um, uh, provided to the construction uh, company via the pest management company that they hired. All right, thank you. I will turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Hurd, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, it's, um, it's a pleasure seeing you, Mr. Uh, Crowder. Ch uh, Crowder, yeah. Uh, and, and I'm sorry I didn't see you uh, if you were at the last sustainable Arlington uh, meeting because um, it's been enjoyable um, having you there, getting your input there. Um, so, um, what I see here is it, right? So there's no no more detailed motion, right? So Mr. Mr. Heim, or through you, Mr. Through you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Heim. Attorney Heim. So I think Ms. Crowder provided her motion uh, uh, in her in her reference materials, Mr. Diggins. If that's what you mean, the proposed amendment. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. Fine. You know, I did see that and sorry, I missed it. I was just looking at your comments now. Uh, so, um, I mean, but I, I do want to dwell on the comments. I mean, and that is, um, so it seems like I mean, uh, we already do it. I mean, so what's, what's your response to, to that, Ms. Crowder? That we already, what, what that, we already that we already, that we already do the, 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 we, the special services already does the, the survey. Uh, that particular survey is is only a portion of what um, what this proposal is. There, the Board of Health has an an item in their dem demolition serve uh, uh, checklist that is requesting a rodent survey and treatment, um, but that only covers complete teardown. Situation. I mean, d demolition. It's only for the demolition. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, may I interject something? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Ms. Uh, Crowder's proposal, uh, to my reading, does a few things. One, uh, right now, the uh, the Board of Health's uh, sort of requirement only applies to demolitions does not apply to open foundation excavations um, or um, large additions. Secondly, um, it basically requires the results of that process to be transmitted as part of that sort of good neighbor process. And then third, it, um, 
add something that currently isn't required, which is that um, I don't believe survey reports, treatment plans, post-treatment reports um, are generally disseminated or required to be disseminated. It also suggests, but does not require for the reasons I think I outlined in my memo, it suggests integrated pest management uh, be encouraged to the maximum extent possible, but it, 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 for the reasons I highlighted, it can't require that integrated pest management be used. Okay. I hope I summarized that correctly, Ms. Crowder. Yes, thank you. And um, I've actually spoken with um, the Board of Health, Natasha Wadden, about, and with uh, Jim Feeney, uh, who previously uh, worked in that role, uh, about their particular question, which focuses on a remediation of bait boxes only. And, uh, and there's interest in upgrading or updating uh, to a more integrated pest management type of language in, in that particular report as well. So the current, the current system is sort of focused on somewhat outdated pest management solutions um, and could be broadened um, along with this. Okay, thank you. And I guess that leads to the second part and maybe um, this will go to uh, Attorney Heim as well. So my understanding um, from your comments, Mr. Heim, is that there is a limit to what the town can ask uh, to be done with respect to pest management. We can't mandate that they do a certain type of pest management. The attorney. That's, that's right, Mr. Diggins. Um, Mr. Chair, if, if I may. Yep. Um, the Attorney General's office uh, has already ruled that local municipalities can't pass ordinances or uh, towns can't uh, pass ordinances that regulate what pesticides, uh, rodenticides, fungicides are used. That is regulated by state law, which is tied into um, federal law. So we, we're not allowed to uh, pass a local regulation that says you have to use X uh, pesticide or rodenticide or something, but you, uh, and you cannot use Y. Um, and it's important for folks to, I guess, uh, bear with me for a second. The reason, because Ms. Crowder asked me a very good question about this uh, in lead up to tonight's hearing, the, re the, the Board of Health is pushing the envelope. So they're, they're requiring stuff that they're not necessarily, um, uh, they're pushing the envelope. And, and the difference between a board of health rule on a demolition permit and what we do in town bylaws is town bylaws get sent to the attorney general's office for review and they will decide whether or not that's consistent with state law or not. So uh, I know that the select board knows this, but I just wanted to, to highlight that for the public that the difference is that our local bylaws all get sent to the municipal law unit and they will uh, almost certainly uh, reject any portion of a bylaw that says you have to use this approach to pest management. Uh, Niggins? I'm sorry, I'm more than this, to this Crowder. Crowder, sorry. Oh, oh, I just, and then I was just going to add, and in contrast, uh, the Board of Health is more policy uh, rather than a bylaw, so it, it's, it's sort of a more town internal uh, checklist kind of thing. Okay. okay. Um, I mean, given the, the limitations on what can be done, a, 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 my inclination is to um, go with no action because it just doesn't seem that town meeting will be able to make any effective change to what's going on. Um, I guess it's just a matter of whether we could do something uh, with respect to the survey that would be um, more satisfying or, 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 or better. I mean, so I need to think about that some more. I mean, so I'm not gonna make a recommendation now, I'm gonna listen. Uh, so that's it, Mr. Hurd, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Um, Ms. Crowder, can you tell me um, what brought this up? 
uh, so uh, you know, in sitting on the board of selectmen for ten years, you you get a lot of people who call you up for a lot of things. Um, no one's ever called me about rats. What what brought the, what made you say this is the art this is the, this is the problem I want to solve? Um, we've had problems with rats. Um, it, it, I'm on a the board of my condominium, and uh, there were there tended not to be. Rats. I, I, I moved to, to Arlington in 2005. I, I never saw a rat. And it wasn't until about 2016, 2017, approximately when things were happening in digging up streets in, in North Cambridge, that I started seeing rats in town. And then we got a tremendous uh, population that was cavorting around in the daytime, which means they're a large population around our dumpster. And um, I happened to hit, we happened to hit a window of opportunity when uh, dry ice was being administered by s certain pest companies uh, to boroughs. And I realized how effective but, this- No, sorry, treatment. but I, I'm sorry. I, I, so what I'm, I shouldn't say, I, I, I have, I do know that for instance, we did have a rat problem where we had to fence in underneath the welcome house and the, the center and stuff like that. I get, let me phrase it in a different way. My first reaction is uh, uh, when is it that we're asking people to incur a cost and we're asking people to slow to both a, a literal cost of actually doing the inspection uh, in, in additional locations. And it's the, also the cost of slowing down their, pro, their construction process, which inherently costs them more money. And I'm not, um, I haven't heard anything that says this is worth the cost. I haven't heard about the problem that we're actually trying to solve. Um, and I, and I'm wondering, is, was there like a construction event that you that you're aware of that triggered this in town that you said, yeah. you know, if we if we had this, then we would then we wouldn't have uh, th then we wouldn't have had that particular outbreak or infestation, or is this is this a general you know like I, I know rats happen sometimes around construction and this is the time to tackle it. The, the uh, construction events that happened in our end of town, which is along Summer Street, were the overlook and summer, the Summer Street projects uh, in, the, in the streets. Um, th that's a little trickier in terms of the ability to use a, a focused, uh, perhaps non, not as uh, toxic uh, product. So um, I but again, Ms. Crowder, I'm not talking this. about the product. I'm talking about the actual problem we're trying to solve. Um, I, I said, yeah, I, the there there have been construction projects in our end of town that that caused increases in the rat population, where a lot more people uh, were 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 finding rats on their property. You saw a lot more use of of uh, rat um, um, bait boxes on properties. Um, and it was associated with excavation. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Crowder. There it is. Mrs. Mahan. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the way that I read this Warren article regarding the road survey and pest management is um, basically it revolves around issuance of a permit, demolition permit, et cetera. Um, so, sort of withholding that. Um, and from what I've gotten from uh, the information that we've received is that um, we really can't withhold that kind of a permit. Uh, we could impose some fines, which is what not what you're um, suggesting. And then the second point as uh, Attorney Heim has, has spoken about that the Attorney General under state law would reject this. Um, in its current form, uh, we, we the town can require some sort of pest management requirement, um, but we cannot under what we 
our town bylaws as well as the attorney general uh, reject uh, a building permit, which is sort of the, the thrux of your warrant article. So um, I don't want to get into a, a convoluted discussion around that, but um, I don't want to put a warrant article through that doesn't meet the test of the attorney general, which we already know how that um, the outcome of that would be. So I, I, I'm totally, uh, I spoke to Kristen Azar down on Dudley Street about compost and rest, uh, rat infestation down there, uh, which is a very serious issue, but I would move no action on this water, water and article. Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Ms. Carter, for, for bringing the, the article. I know the, the, there is a, um, Concerns all over town with 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 rat issues, but I, I do have some concerns about you know, what's already being done administratively versus adding adding a bylaw. And I realize that what your proposal would do is is maybe increase the number of instances where the survey would have to be done um, beyond just the issuance of a, of a demolition permit. But it it really, to me, it is really withholding the permit itself or the, or the building permit that's gonna spur action here. And, and where the second half of what you're proposing, we, we can't do because it's preempted by state law. Um, I, I'm, I think I'm inclined to support the, the, the no action at this time, although I would like to follow up with Attorney High maybe at some point to see if there are additional um, situations where it, there can be further requirements for, for surveys beyond just the demolition situation that doesn't require us to change the bylaw. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I know my neighborhood and I've heard in other neighborhoods that there certainly are issues with rodents. Um, so the issue is there. Whether or not this is the best way to fight that, I don't know at this time, um, but I am inclined to support the motion as well. This is a public hearing. If any members of the public would like to speak, use the raise hand function on your Zoom application now. All right, we have Ms. Henkin. Hello, um, Anna Hankin, Marion Road again. Um, even if the board can't see this article as written, I really would like to support you working with the with Elaine Crowder to approach this problem more. I personally have seen many, many rats on Mass Ave in e over the evenings. Um, they often run across the street here. Um, especially near construction projects. Um, and it really would be good for the town to address large rat populations. Not only are they, you know, kind of a health and safety hazard and spread disease and are kind of dangerous for pets, um, but they also cause a lot of just structural damage to buildings and can even damage a lot of electrical, causing electrical fires. And that's, that's just a major town problem. Um, and Definitely, we should be encouraging the use of things like dry ice. I've personally used it in oncology research when sacrificing animals, and it's very safe and very easy to use. Um, and it's way, way better than poison for dealing with burrows. Um, and it doesn't impact the environment as much as using poison does, because um, that can harm wild animals, that can harm children, that can harm pets. Um, and even if this, as written, isn't the right way to do this, I really, really encourage you guys to work with Mrs. Crowder on this, because this is a problem that we should definitely address. And it's not super hard to address. It's, it's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. And I will go back to the board. That is all the public comments that we have. Mr. Dickens, any additional comments? Oh, I mean, I, I do support, you know, um... The, the idea of trying to do better pest management. So I'm going to encourage you to continue uh, coming to sustainable Arlington uh, meetings. I mean, uh, I think that'll be a good way to 
work with the town. I mean, uh, we care about these kinds of things. I mean, uh, and, and I think part of it will come down to how do we encourage people who are doing pest management uh, to do it in a better way. That that um, uh, attachment that you gave from the CDC was very good. I mean, um, and so we can try to encourage people to do that here locally. And I think the other thing is to try to work this on the, on the state level I mean, uh, and get the attorney general I mean, to get folks to do pest management in a better way. So yes, let's do continue working on this, but I am gonna support the no action. If for another reason then, because even if we increase the, the kind of survey, I mean, we still get to a point where we can't make them do the right thing. And so uh, we shouldn't lead town meeting to think differently. Thank you. Mr. Dunn? No comment. Mrs. Mahan? No further comment, thank you. Mr. DeCorsi. Uh, no further comments. All right, Attorney Hyman, we have a motion for no action that's been seconded. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Mr. DeCorsi, I'd be happy to talk to Ms. Crowder further and uh, Ms. Waden and Mr. Feeney about um, what our internal options are in the meantime uh, for uh, better uh, regulation as you suggested. On the motion, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you, Ms. Crowder. That brings us to Article 23, Vote Affordable, Affordable Overlay Study. Do you have Mr. Hamlin? Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. All right, let me catch my breath, sorry. Ooh. Okay, so I'd like to ask you to allow for the vote for an affordable overlay study. I'd like to thank uh, Doug Heim for, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to catch my breath. Oof. Oh, sorry about that. Let me uh, come back in a few seconds, hold up. Sorry about that. I just lost my breath for a second. All right, so uh, thank you, Select Board. I'm asking for the opportunity to present to town meeting an affirm affirmative action on the vote for an affordable housing overlay study. My understanding is that uh, when it comes to uh, chapter, I think it's like 40R or something, in the state, it allows for smart growth overlay districts. Uh, the city of Somerville and Cambridge just recently passed their affordable overlay. And I think that it'd be in the best interest to study whether or not their supposed claims of uh, increased affordability prices and to see whether or not the claims that they make can best serve the town of Arlington. Ooh, hold up. Sorry about that, I just need to get some water. So my understanding and with the help of Doug Heim was that the city of the town of Natick themselves recently had an overlay district that was called Hoop. And I provided that in the reference sheet. And the reason why I think it'd be interesting is if the town of Arlington were able to figure out that there is a benefit to you know, creating a whole swat of parcels as an overlay district for the sake of um, home affordability and smart growth, it may be beneficial. Now, the reason why I chose a study is that I don't want to rush or be divisive in forming an immediate means of how to create affordable overlay district because I don't want to 
choose a precinct. I didn't feel equipped to do so, nor did I know where this would Essentially, I didn't know which jurisdiction to point this to. Tonight, I seek your advisement to proceed with this vote and to offer guidance on how to make this appropriate for town meeting for the pursuit of its adoption and expansion, but primarily to discover its scope and where to uh, stay where we can be precedential and productive. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. DeCorsing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ch uh, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Hamlin, um, just the town manager and I, I and, and perhaps Attorney Heim. I know there's reference here to the housing production plan, and, and my understanding is that the the current plan housing production plan expires in October of this year, which will require a new plan to be undertaken. And I'm just wondering if they one if either could confirm that and and. Um, to if, if there are plans to uh, later in the calendar year to start a, a, a start with a new plan. Mr. Chaplain. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, yes, Mr. DeCorsia, I can confirm uh, both of those items that yes, the, the current housing production plan does expire later this calendar year, uh, but also that the planning and community development staff are, are just now starting the process of um, of, do, of doing an update on the housing production plan so that that work will get underway very shortly. Okay, thank you. So it, it, it seems to me that, that that would be the appropriate place to, to study overlay districts uh, on affordability and to um, undertake that study um, as, as part of something that is, is required to be done with the state. We had our first one go. And uh, you, you mentioned that you don't want to rush this. So this is something that would take place later this year. but. Um, you know, with a, perhaps a comment from us that this is something that, that certainly is worth studying. I, I'd be inclined to, well, actually I will move no action on this with, with that proviso that, um, you know, we expect that this may be studied as part of the next plan. Thank you. Mr. Dunn. Uh, no additional, um, actually, the, so um, I, my comment is that I agree with Steve. I think he's uh, saying the right thing. Uh, I, I think it definitely makes sense to look into it further. And I think that the, the town's housing plan, like that process and looking at it as a part of that is a really good way to do it. Thank you. Mrs. Vaughn. My first question would be, did Mr. Dunn second that? If not, I will. I meant to, thank you. So that was a second versus just a new it was. I, I seconded, I apologize for not being clear. Okay, and I'm, I'm not trying to be picky and I just don't wanna jump the jump the, the, the boat or anything like that. Um, and um, I agree with my colleagues' uh, previous remarks that um, planning and community development as part of the next step um, will sort of take what this Warren article is sort of driving at what it wants to do. Um, but I, if I could third Mr. DeCourcy and Mr. Dunn's recommendation of no action, I would, but um, it's been a vote of no action seconded. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Hamlin. I mean, I, I really appreciate the, the links that you provided too. It was interesting. The, and, and your objectivity in what you provided because the one uh, from Cambridge that then indicated that they wouldn't be getting a lot of units necessarily at the beginning uh, was 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 um, was interesting. And, uh, and it's interesting to see what Cambridge is doing and, and some other places, what, what they're doing. Um, and Mr. Corsi suggested um, exactly what I was going to suggest, I mean, about um, this, the next iteration of the housing production plan. Uh, they could investigate this, but on top of that, and there are some other groups in town that are really thinking and discussing housing issues. And, and I will encourage you to engage with them uh, because I think this would be uh, an interesting thing to discuss. Also, there are some members on uh, the ARB who I think would be interested in talking with you about this. And I would be interested in talking with you and them about this in order to get a better handle on things. So you know how to get in touch with me, get in touch with me and we'll, we'll work on this in parallel to what's going on uh, with the uh, next iteration of the housing production plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. 
and I'll fifth the motion. Um, but just say that thank you for bringing it forward because bringing the article forward makes sure that we specifically incorporate this into the house production plan as it moves forward. So I do appreciate the, the thoughtfulness and bringing the issue front and center. This okay. is a public hearing. We have one hand raised, Judith Garber. All right, Ms. Garber, can you hear us? Yep. Yes, hi, Judith Garber, Mass Ave. Um, thanks for the board for hearing this article and thanks to Guillermo for, for bringing this forward. Um, I, I'm speaking in support of, of the article, but I also understand what the select board is saying and the proper path to go through maybe the housing uh, production plan. And I'm curious if the board has any suggestions. I know I, I appreciate the board recommending that the housing, uh, the people putting together housing production plan will look at this specifically. And I'm wondering, you know, in terms of avenues for public participation on that, um, what would be the best uh, avenues for that? I much, much appreciate your advice. Thanks. And do you want to take that on, Ms. Figgins? Yes, I, mean, I, I just want to say that those meetings are open to the public. You know, they are generally the first Thursdays of the month. And, and so uh, the typical um, way meetings work is we, they uh, discuss things amongst themselves. Mean, and then after that, they take comments and questions from, from the public. Mean, and uh, I'm the liaison to that committee. so. Uh, if you find uh, it difficult to interact at any time, feel free to reach out to me and I'll convey your questions and concerns. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. And we have Laura Kiesel. Uh, Hi, I, uh, Laura Kiesel, um, Precinct 6 Mass Avenue. I also wanted to speak in support of this. Um, I wanted to offer that, you know, Arle Arlington, um, I actually held a panel on affordable housing last month and I had many um, speakers, including uh, the advocacy director of the National Low Income Housing Coalition who, and they're also having their conference this week, which I am attending and, um, when I was doing my research for my own article, I wanted to, I, I was really surprised because Ar Arlington is behind almost all of our municipal neighbors in affordable housing, with the exception of Winchester, and in many cases, very far behind. And in just um, the past 20 years, we have only increased our affordable housing stock by 0.1%. That's 0.1%. And so um, I really think Arlington needs to be a more aggressive. I've heard on this call both with my warrant and now um, with Guillermo's warrant, a lot of talk affirming the need for affordable housing, but there's a lot of action not being taken and to just have discussions. Before COVID hit, homelessness had increased in the Metro West by over 45%. Um, meanwhile, over 82% of the housing stock we're creating is market rate in, in the area, in the Boston metro area, and that has exacerbated the issue. So unless we're going to actually start taking tangible actions during a pandemic where the homelessness has increased even from what it was and was already at historically high levels, um, a lot of people are going to, to die. And um, there, there are results to us not taking more assertive action. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. And that closes the public comment. Mr. Hamlin, did you want to wrap up? Yes. Thank you um, to the chair for acknowledging my ability just to close up remarks and to thank select board. I'd like to thank you guys for letting me um, hyperventilate my speech uh, earlier. I was doing some chores and I ran over here when I heard the, uh, the, the subject. So I greatly appreciate um, I would like to thank each and every one of you. Um, uh, despite voting no action, your comments were clarifying. And I look forward to this being an addition to the, I believe it's the October um, addition to, um, as you've advised. And uh, I look forward to working with you, Select Board Member Diggins, um, moving forward, as well as each and every one of you. I am looking to make this as, uh, as comprehensive as possible. And, primarily uh, effectual. So feel free to um, reach out to me. I look forward to talking to each and every one of you. 
to make this something that could be uh, adopted. Thank you. Thank you. So Attorney Hammond, we have a motion for no action that has been seconded. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's five zero vote. All right. And that brings us to Article 81 Resolution Broadway Corridor Design Competition. Is Ms. Thornton with us? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Yep, no problem. If you could just start with your name for the record. Barbara, Barbara Thornton and I'm at Park Avenue in Arlington, Precinct 16. All right. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the article? <laughs> I have this feeling of deja vu. Uh, and the last one always. Um, yes, this, this article uh, has been presented to you before. And it, I am here tonight because as I found out on Friday, uh, it was not voted, it was tabled. And so I'm here to encourage you to take it off the table and, it, and move it forward. And uh, the, the, the story, I'm, I'm not gonna repeat because you've heard of the you know, great, great study done, move the town forward, Town has huge opportunities for uh, doing zoning in another year. They've started the housing production plan process, but the community there needs to be some community action that will give people a vision of what should happen. And I'm hoping that you will agree with me that a good vision would be uh, to do something like a design competition. And I got to say, I'm feeling a little bit like, I don't know if you've seen the movie Chevy Chase and the European Vacation, where he goes around and around and around that rotary. And I feel like I'm going around and around and around that rotary here. And I'm looking for a path tonight with you to get off the rotary and go down a road that we can get to a vision for the town of Arlington to see alternatives of what housing could look like without doing it town-wide, just get some plans, get some pictures, get some architects involved, get some planners involved and do a competition, throw out a little money here and there, uh, $100 for first prize, $50 for second prize, get some students involved, get some practitioners involved and get some stuff that we can do a little like September festival, a town day maybe and show the results. So people can see what more density looks like, what more climate uh, responsive housing looks like, what more green space looks like, how it might combine to make everybody happy or not, and then move into the housing production plan and the uh, April voting at town meeting the following year on all these zoning articles. Thank you, Ms. Thornton. Is that enough? Yep. And my recollection is that we tabled this, Mr. Chaplain, to see if the planning department could do this internally? Is, did we have any movement on that? Uh, she wrote a response, by the way, uh, yeah. that night. I got back to her and I said, did, did, she, did anybody reach out to you? She said, I wrote, I said, you know, so that I can read it to you. I have it on my screen, but you probably do yeah. too. Yeah, Ms. Chaplain. So I did talk to Ms. Reid about this today and I think she's very supportive of the concept, but similar to the last warrant article, felt like it should, could or should either be part of the housing production plan process or potentially be an outcome of the housing plan production process. Um, I, I don't think that actually puts it off much further than it maybe would take to get it up and running anyway. So I, I, I don't know what the board ultimately would want to, to do with this article. I think we have a willing and interested uh, town and town, town department of planning and community development, um, just figuring out how doing something like this fits into the housing plan, housing production plan process, I think would be the work to do. All right, Mr. Dunn. Um, sorry. Um, 
I'll pass. I want to listen more. Thank you. Can I? Pardon? Yep. Can I make a, a point to that? The I looked in after our, our last meeting. I uh, had initiated a process to have the uh, Federal Home Loan Bank Board kind of host this. And I realized that working with universities and, and organizations like that, they have six month timetables. You either make it on that six month timetable or you're out for six months. It's That's not like a few weeks, that's a long time. So that's why I'm urging that we sort of, even though the, the uh, housing production plan process is just getting started, and this is where I'm looking at you all for this road off this circle, because I think that one of the things you should consider is instead of me coming before, or me and people like me coming before you every time for a, um, for an issue that we want a joint action for, can there be an intermediate process? So maybe you each have a portfolio that you're particularly like around town affairs. So I could go to the housing portfolio person and say, here's my idea. How do you suggest I proceed rather than coming to you at 9.30 at night on Monday nights and or later? Yeah, okay. Mr. Gorsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's in, in, interesting, Ms. Thornton. I was, I was thinking of one of Chevy Chase's colleagues on Saturday Night Live. It feels like Groundhog Day to me because we've had this had a, a few times, but I, we did have the benefit of, of the minutes from our February 22nd meeting actually were posted this evening. I'm looking at them now, and, and you know there was a, indeed a motion to table to allow you to have conversations with Ms. Rate and Mr. Chapdelaine. And, and where I am now, I mean, I hate to, I, I didn't know when this was coming back. I, I was hoping you were coming back to tell us that you had conversations and, and this, that the study is going to take place and it's, it's not going to require a vote. And, and I'm not going to make a motion at this point, but I, I almost feel like one of us, and I'd be willing to, to do it, maybe you should have a conversation with Mr. Chapdelaine and Ms. Ray and, and with you and come back next week in terms of what was was happening here because to be honest with you I, I wasn't expecting to be asked to to, to vote on this tonight because I, I i thought it was going to be worked out yeah i didn't know i was supposed to i because i did talk to jenny back and forth over the last few weeks about this including i got an email back from her on monday but um i didn't know i was supposed to talk to uh, uh mr chapdelaine as well sorry yeah, and you may not have to. I mean, it, I think it was one or the other. It, it, it just, um, but I, I just think from where we're sitting, you're coming back here, and I will say it's it's certainly better at nine thirty eight than than at twelve fifteen in the morning. I think, which was the last time. But yeah. I I just feel like it, it's there's not much before us. You've had some conversations, but I think we might need to to get a little bit more information. Um, but but I'll again, I'm not going to make the motion. I'd like to hear what my colleagues have to say on this. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, so, uh, well, look, your, your idea, Ms. Thornton, about me having a contact on the select board in, or some or someone in, so that you can bring up these ideas in, and not have to make uh, resolutions in, or, or um, other articles is a good one. In, and maybe we do need to try to formalize that process or make it somehow more public because I think I mean, a lot of the articles that we saw in this year's warrant were cries. Well, let me rephrase that. I, I just I want to I want to neutralize it. They they were seeking attention, you know, uh, for important issues. And and, um, and a lot of times we were saying, well, this isn't the right way to go about it. And I think we need to let people know what is the right way to go about it, or at least what is a better way to go about it. Um, we, I see where you're coming from with the comp with the competition, Dave, but I keep thinking that there's got to be maybe a simpler, more direct way uh, to do this. I mean, um, and especially since we're talking small sums of money, the, then it's not going to be the money that's attracting people to do this. It's going to be the desire to engage in this kind of a process. The, uh, and since we're talking so little money, we, I would say let's try to do that because once we put money into it, then it becomes like a barrier 
me, then we have to go through a process because now the time is going to spend money to do it. And we can't just spend money, you know, um, me without clearing it somehow. Me, so I would say we let's think about how we can get this going. I mean, um, you, as you said, you need to do it sooner rather than later. Uh, if you feel it, that the, it, in order to reach out to universities, it needs the imprimatur of the town in order to do that. I can see that, but at the same time, Ms. Thornton, I think you have all the imprimatur that's needed to move oh, no. anyone. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. We need to move anyone you know, that, 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 that you want to move. I mean, I've seen you do it. I, mean, I, I saw no, you do it with, with uh, Mr. Chair. Can you stop the back and forth, please? <laughs> so so, uh, so, so uh, I see you do it with the, the, with the business school I mean, uh, in that series that you, you, you did. So so uh, we can move forward with this. I mean, uh, uh, and, uh, but at the same time, I mean, yeah, I guess I mean, having... I, I kind of have a sense of what's going on um, with um, the town in, in terms of the, the house production plan. Uh, and I know the focus is, is shifting to that. Uh, and so I guess I'm a little concerned that if we put it on the town, we, it's just not going to move fast because of bandwidth issues. And, and so and I really want to keep that, keep it on you. Uh, and. And it seems like I'm getting more involved with housing. And somehow we're going to tie transportation into this because you can't, what's good is a house if you can't get there. Huh? So we're going to tie those all together and we'll work together on this. Uh, uh, so I think it's going to be better, you know, um, that we do uh, uh, a no action on this I mean, um, for respect to town meeting, I mean, but that you and I and whoever else, I me mean, who wants to act on it, uh, we'll act on it and, and have something to tell the housing production, uh, the housing plan implementation committee, me, when they start taking up the housing production plan. Uh, and if nothing else, we can give an example of what a contest can do. You know, so um, I'm offering to work with you on it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, yikes, holy guacamole. Um, I was going, my motion would be to, uh, it's a resolution uh, that I would um, move favorable action on the resolution um, regarding Ms. Thornton's uh, resolution for the Broadway Carter Design Competition in light of, unless Mr. Chapelain can correct me if I misheard what he said, that um, the Planning and Community Development uh, Department indicated that uh, this resolution, it's not a warrant article, um, could be incorporated into, I guess what I would ask the town manager is, did I hear you correctly? And if I did not, please tell me that this resolution could be incorporated through the Department of Planning and Community Development under their housing production plan process. So I... Uh, I, th I think what I, I'll, I'll try to say again is planning and community development is, is supportive of Ms. Thornton's um, plan here or what she wants to accomplish. Um, it's not entirely clear to me whether we should do it um, sort of parallel to the update to the housing production plan or as an outcome of the housing production plan. Um, I mean, I think either a po independently a positive vote of this board endorsing the idea or forwarding the resolution to town meeting in support of the idea is is okay. Um, I mean, I think as you heard from Mr. Diggins comments and what I'm hearing from board members tonight, I think one way or the other, we want to work with Ms. Thornton to get this done. Um, we just, I think we just wanna make sure it's done um, you, it, with sort of best and most efficiently utilizing town resources to do it. Okay, so, so my motion would be, with apologies to Mr. Diggins, um, to vote in support of this resolution. It's not a uh, bylaw amendment or anything like that. I'd like to move um, favorable action um, to support the resolution regarding the Broadway corridor design competition um, uh, under the auspices of our Planning and Community Development Department vis-a-vis -vis the housing production plan process. Thank you. 
and I actually was going to have comments very similar to Ms. Mahan that I think it's a good idea. Everyone said it's a good idea. Planning says it's a good idea. And it's a resolution. And it looks like the housing production plan is where it will be implemented anyways. So, you know, I, I think we can support a motion to approve this. It can be ratified by town meeting and then it can be implemented, implemented through planning going forward. So I will look for a second. Um, Mr. Dunn? Second. And any additional comments, Mr. DeCourcy? But no further comments. And Mr. Diggins, I'm not sure if you actually did move no action, but if you did, <laughs> did you? Well, I, I, I think that's I think that's why Ms. Mahan was apologizing and no apology necessary to the extent I did. I I, I withdraw it happily. You know, but I will say to uh, Ms. Thornton, we're still gonna work on this sooner rather than later. Just just so you know. You know. I see. <laughs> All right, this is a public hearing. If any members of the public would like to speak on this article, please use the raise hand function on your Zoom application. Seeing none, Attorney Hyman, we have a motion to approve that's been seconded. Mrs. Mahan. Sorry, I couldn't get my mute off. Um, yes, and, and to Ms. Thornton, please keep bringing and re-bringing your ideas to us, whether I'm on the board or not. I, I really appreciate the time and, and uh, energy and expertise you put into this. So um, thank, thank you, thank you so Ms. much. Thank you, Attorney Hyman, yes. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Apparently we're all in better moves before 10 o'clock, yes. <laughs> You're done. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Five zero vote. Ms. Thornton. All right. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chaplain, if you don't mind, I'm going to just give you a call at some point. Maybe we can chat this week or whenever it's convenient for you about uh, how cheap it could be. And, and Lynn, I will be talking to you too. Thank you. Any, any, conversation, any conversation about how cheap something can be the town manager's interested in, so we'll take it. Well, it's something, but it's still, it's still cheap. And, and I appreciate very much Len Diggins feeling that I can achieve this kind of stuff on my own. It's not possible without you. It really isn't. It's uh, so I, I, I thank you so much. And I think an award from Arlington to an architect for their design would be a, a wonderful tribute on their, on their desk. An award from Barbara Thornton for their design wouldn't be. All right. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of love in the air tonight. All right, final votes and comments. Articles for review. We have Article 6, Bylaw Amendment CPAC Member Term Limits. Article 11, Bylaw Amendment Stormwater Management. Article 14, Bylaw Amendment Gutters and Historic Districts. Article 15, Bylaw Amendment Domestic Partnerships. Article 19, Vote Establishment of Town Committee on Auto and Property Insurance Claims and Losses. Article 20, Vote Public remote participation, Article 24, Home Rule leg Legislation, Ranked Choice Voting. Article 26, Endorsement of CDBG Application. You have the final votes before us. I will run through the articles again. Speak up if you have any revisions, objections to any of the articles that we will vote on together. Article 6, Article 11. Article 14, Article 15, Article 19, Article 20. Yes. Sorry. Yes. I, I, I had previous conversations with uh, Doug. Let me let's listen to him. All right, turn your hand. Um, so I, I first of all wanted to say that uh, thank you uh, to a few board members who sent some uh, both administrative comments and, and substantive comments in question. I also uh, received a series of questions and comments from the article's proponent, um, who I think expressed some frustration that I hadn't reached out. Uh, so I apologize for that. It's been a little bit of a crunch time and I, you know, uh, try, to, try to do that better. Uh, I'll try to do that better in the future when uh, it comes to articles uh, proposed by a member of the public, but I felt like the directive was fairly clear here. 
I did want to just forward some qu questions that I, I think I understand the answer to the board on this, uh, but um, my understanding is that the board's motion is to have it report, report to spring 22 town meeting, but if they can report things before then, um, great, they can report things before uh, spring 2022 20, annual town meeting. My understanding is further that um, you're looking for recommendations, uh, including recommendations that would go on the 2022 town meeting warrant, but that you know that doesn't necessarily limit the scope of recommendations to only warrant articles. Uh, obviously, the board understands the warrant article process very well, um, and um, I think there was some questions from the proponent about whether or not the IT department or finance committee should be on the committee, and further uh, whether or not. Um, there should be other members appointed who have uh, who don't have experience having their meetings uh, video recorded. So, in the spirit of the sort of uh, collaborative approach that the board has taken on this article, I just wanted to raise those concerns and answer some of those questions um, as best as I understand the board's motion. Uh, but again, the two questions seem to be about whether or not the IT department or the finance committee should be on this represented, and the other question was about whether or not. Um, other types of uh, boards and bodies um, that don't have experience with being video recorded should be represented. My understanding from you, Mr. Dunn, was that you anticipated that this body would take some survey of other public bodies um, and not just focus on the bodies that are represented, but I just wanted to try to make sure that I clearly understood these, these issues and were representing both the board and the sort of spirit of what was going on uh, fairly. Mr. Dunn? Uh, thank you. So, yes. Uh, so, I, I, I um, so, it, this group that we're creating, the study, or not we're creating, that we're asking town meeting to create, should um, come to a conclusion for all the committees, which means that they should be talking to, uh, at least, uh, I'm not sure you have to talk to all of them, but you should certainly should be representative. Of them, and so I certainly, so I think it would be appropriate to adjust the charge, maybe, to make it clear that they're supposed to be doing, like you know, part of what they're supposed to be doing is to be investigating or, or what other committees need and want and, and do. Um, but obviously, we can't get representatives of all of them on the committee, so we shouldn't even try. We should just make sure that that group does it. On the second question about whether or not someone from the uh, IT uh, uh, should be on there. I actually, in my head, I was figuring that um, I had never actually asked Adam this, but I was guessing that Adam was going to appoint his uh, the, the IT director to be the uh, on the, his nominee person on this committee, and so I envisioned it being handled that way. And whether it should be someone from the finance committee should be on there. Um, gently, I didn't think it was they they didn't. I didn't think that they, uh, no, that wasn't on my list of people who, who should be there. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. All right, and so do we need, just to make sure that I'm understanding where we are, do you want to table this one for a final vote to the next meeting, or are we okay to vote on it as is? Um. I don't feel like the changes we're making right here is substantive, so it's really about whatever you, whatever the board and Doug are comfortable with. Okay. All right, Mr. Diggins, any comments on Article Twenty? Um, no, no, no questions. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with the current vote standing. Yep. Mrs. Mahan. Um. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If you or Mr. Don and Mr. Chaplin could remind me. Uh. Where is the select board representation or, or no on this or on article? I think there should be, right? Uh, yes, there is one uh, member of the select board or its designee. Okay. Um, yes, it's, I, I'm, it's. I'm just a little confused <laughs> uh, following Mr. Dun Dunn's remarks just because it seems like there's some more issues to be um, delineated out, um, as well as the original proponent of this Warren article, I felt 
Uh, I think we tried to get it back on track, but really kind of went astray on that. So I, I don't know, Mr. Dunn, if you could kind of allay some of my concerns. Sure. Um, so if we could table this or if you want to vote for this tonight. Um, how about let's do both. Let's table it and let me speak to it, if that's okay. Thank you, please. All right. Help so, uh, art, so in the draft of art, the text article 20, 1A is one member of the select board, one member of the, sorry, select board or designee, school committee or designee, ARB or designee, town manager or designee, member of disability commission or designee, four members of town meeting appointed by the moderator. So those, those are the nine. The draft has a 10th, but that's a mistake. So we're striking that, those are the nine. And so the, the question of finance committee, I'm saying no. And on question of IT, I'm saying the town manager can handle that with his, does with his nominee. So I'm saying no change to the to the draft. And then I'm rereading the charge and the charge is pretty good. It says the committee is charged with comprehensively examining options and requirements for market participation in public meetings and other candidates to level require in-person attendance shall include, uh, the study shall include benefits and challenges examining what portions of meetings can be and should. Um, so I think maybe uh, we can add an item to the charge, Doug, that's, uh, something like considering uh, evaluating um, like committee size and prominence, you know, some committees operate, you know, live on ACMI on a weekly basis and some of them don't. And so, and I think that that would cover what we, what that point that we were talking about. And then um, Mr. Chair, I move that we uh, table this till next week for further consideration. All right. No, I would second that. All right. Any comments from Mr. Corsi? No comments. All right, and then any comments or questions on Article 24? I, I, I have a comment, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yeah, I spoke with Attorney Heim and I, it, this doesn't affect the vote, but there were eight asked to just insert language that, that the board is unanimous on ranked choice voting as to single seat elections. The difference that, that, that I had was with the multi-seat and just wanted to make that clear in the, uh, in, the, in the comment. All right, thank you. And article 26. All right, and so do we have- Can I, can I just ask, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, on article 26, um, if I could ask Mr. Chaplain I don't expect him to know the answer tonight. If he does, God bless you. If not, um, regarding the um, CDBG CARES Act, Recovery Act, um, the last CDBG subcommittee meeting, we were told we may meet, that we will meet again in July for a subsequent um, federal funding that we'll need to talk about and, and delineate those funds uh if you could investigate that and or if you already know the answer to that or if you're going to get back to me on that so i i can say tonight i i've not heard any news of new cdbg funds from either the cares act or the rescue act i think that still remains an open possibility but i, I don't have any new information tonight okay thank you i apologize mr chair i kind of piggybacked on that but i appreciate it thank you no problem it's done uh, sorry, I apologize. Uh, on, back on 24, the ranked choice voting. Um, I also talked with Doug over the weekend or about changing one of the paragraphs in the comment. Did that draft make it or should we table that for people to look at next week? Attorney Hyde? It did make it. So the draft that you have in, on Novus is the draft with the revised paragraph. Okay. So depending upon... Um, Mr. Dunn, may I explain Please. the uh, error? So, or, so uh, clarification. The, yeah, the uh, the draft comment that I initially uh, transmitted uh, basically talked about single seat races in terms of getting above uh, fifty percent threshold, but the revised motion to reflect the majoritarian approach doesn't actually use that term. What essentially happens, uh, oh gosh, I hope we're gonna get this right, is that the, uh, the lowest uh, uh, vote earning folks get eliminated off the bottom um, 
and this revised paragraph more accurately reflects the way in which the single uh, seatbelt uh, uh, occurs. So I hope that that's a... Yeah. How about this? I move that we table because I want another crack just to make sure I read it. I, I apologize, Doug. I, I didn't look at the revised. Since. No, it's my fault. It's my fault. Thank right. you. So you want to amend your motion to table Article 20 to table Articles 20 and 24. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep. All right. So then with that, I'll look for a motion to approve Articles 6, 11, 14, 15, 19, and 26. So moved. With a second by? Second. Good begins. All right. So Attorney Heim. On the motion to approve. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. And on the motion to table. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. All right. Thank you. Takes us to correspondence received. Concerns regarding dangerous crosswalk on Summer Street. Chris Shores, Arlington resident. Move receipt. Ms. Chaplin. Uh, if you could ref also refer that to Dan Amstead, Senior Transportation Planner. He's uh, done some work in terms of analyzing the intersection and responded to residents in the past. And also just so happens, I think, to live near that intersection. So he has some firsthand experience as well. So uh, if you would refer that to him, he'd be able to, I think, more than adequately respond to the residents' concerns. Sure. Thank you. All okay. Right. Um, move receipt and refer to the town manager to um, Mr. Amschutz. Thank you. With a second. Second. All right. Attorney Hyde. This is Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Let's go. Business. Attorney Hyde. Uh, quickly, I just want to say that I, I know we have a few uh, uh, last sort of matters to have for uh, Warren Article hearings. Um, I will do my best to draft what I think are potential comments in advance. Uh, so that the board can basically have a one article hearing and comments. I'll also plan to bring back a full draft select board report for the board's review uh, and approval. That'll give you another opportunity to make sure that the report looks uh, basically the way you want and, and reflects accurately everybody's uh, votes on all these matters. Uh, and I also just wanna say that I've, I know that the last couple of final votes and comments uh, are resolutions uh, that a few uh, article proponents, Ms. Saunders, Ms. Malache, a few others have been patiently waiting on. Uh, they're at the top of my list this week. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chaplin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, simply a restatement from prior new business that uh, the town is expecting to be the recipient of a significant sum of money from the American Rescue Act. Uh, however, we are still awaiting further detailed regulations from the federal government about exact manner in which we'll be able to expend um, or utilize those funds. And, and as soon as we receive that information, of course, we'll let the board know as well as the general public. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sort of piggybacking on the town manager's comments, um, I'd echo what he has said. Um, Mr. DeCourcy is the chairperson of the Long Range Planning Committee, where we've had um, many, well, maybe not many, well, one or two discussions uh, reg regarding the American Rescue Act, as well as other people with conversations. Um, I, I would say that uh, as it stands right now, our next meeting would be on April 12th. If I'm remembering that correctly, where, uh, or maybe I'm remembering it incorrectly. Talk about our Slackman's meeting? We have one next month. Uh, no, long range planning. Oh, okay. yep. uh, next long range planning is going to be April 12th. Uh, and, and one of the uh, sort of titular uh, meeting points um, before the 12th will be the Finance Committee. 
um, meeting on, I believe, March 31st, March 31st with the uh, school committee, um, which uh, I know my colleagues know how ardent I've been in holding everyone's feet to the same fire. Um, but uh, I won't go into too much detail on that, but uh, I've been somewhat uh, frustrated along with my colleagues on the school committee in terms of dealing with COVID, dealing with uh, kids who are uh, attending school hybrid, remote, um, and what those numbers mean back to Arlington, as well as um, I know on the long range planning committee, we've had talk about an override in the few coming years, um, which the uh, American Rescue Act may push it out one more year before that, but I think um, through the Long Range Planning Committee, which Mr. DeCourcy chairs uh, this year, and hopefully in the next year or years to come, um, we really need to have a, as a, a Baptist member, a come to Jesus talk about uh, getting our hands around those numbers. And then the uh, second uh, issue I would raise is um, it seems as though April 5th is sort of a date that cities and towns and perhaps including Arlington is sort of a quasi reopening or um, reinstituting uh, people being being able to come to town building. So what, what I'd like to do if I could through the chair is um, ask Mr. Chapdelaine um, are there uh, on April 5th any town either buildings or programs where there's vaccines or likewise that will either be reopening or having a soft opening? Chaplain? So there are no plans tied to April 5th uh, for town buildings other than school buildings, primarily um, because the, the majority of the populations working in those town buildings are not yet vaccinated. Uh, however, we are, we're looking at sort of planning towards uh, end of June, early July date for what would look like a town hall and town office reopening to the public in some form as that aligns with when we think the majority of the population will be vaccinated. But we expect to be bringing staff back to offices Basically, you know, th those already there increasing over the course of the next month or so, working towards when um, when we reach herd immunity, 70 to 80 percent vaccination, mm -hmm. when we start welcoming, probably still in a controlled fashion, but welcoming residents back into town office buildings. Um, not so much residents. Um, I know that the select board treasurers and town clerk's office have had staff mm -hmm. in for couple months now. Are you saying that the town manager's office, the planning department, the library, and other town offices are not going to open the staff? What, what we do in the select board's office, town clerk's office, and treasurer's office is we've been there for two to three months, and you need to call or email to make an appointment, and then we have a um, uh, safe procedures in order for you to effectuate your business with that. Are you saying that your office and the planning department and the credit union and payroll and all the other offices are not going to open until July? No, that's not. In, in a similar model as the select board's office is doing? To me, not to be disrespectful, but I don't understand why the select board's office, I'm just going to pick that as one, um, has been open for the past two months, but you all can wait till July. I, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, Ms. Maha. That's that is not what I what I said. I, I was speaking in regards to when the public would be welcomed back into the buildings in the July timeframe. Uh, we will be ramping up office staffing over the course of the next several months as more and more people are eligible or become vaccinated. Um, so all, all of the offices you listed um, have had staff in them over the course of the past several months and we'll be increasing that staffing capacity. Um, again, it's just happening now and continuing over the next few months. So you're still saying July, because this is the end of March. So 
the next few months is July. Um, what I'm saying is why can't we get the rest of the town offices operating as the select board, town clerk and treasurers? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that that is exactly what we are working to do now. And, and it's not, it's not waiting until July. July, Ju the July timeframe only has to do with reopening offices for access to the public. Uh, the next several months will be spent incrementally bringing people back into the offices as people become vaccinated. Okay, I, I guess I'm confused why um, the three offices I cited have not been vaccinated, but they're in there working. I, I just wanna know when town hall will operate as three departments of the town hall have been operating for two months and why it's gonna take another two months for them to come back into the office. I'm not saying let the public in, but come back into the office. What I can do and provide to you, Ms. Mahan, and, and the, um, the entire board is draft uh, a plan for what, what our plan is for town hall offices and other town administrative offices uh, in, the, in the coming weeks and months. That'd be great. And I'd, I'd prefer it in the coming weeks. I understand everybody working at home. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Jacorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I just wanted to update the board um, in, in the community. We had um, last Monday, the chairman, Mr. Chapdelaine, Attorney Heim, um, it, it, Ms. Rate, and, and um, Senator Friedman had a call with Mass Housing in response to the letter that we had authorized where we were seeking Mass Housing to make a determination that the changes to the Mugar site were substantial and that they were so substantial that it required that the restoration of the townhouses um, back to the original design or, or even a, a revocation of the eligibility letter. Um, we had a spirited conversation for over an hour with Mass Housing. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending. I really want to thank uh, the Senator Friedman for her adv advocacy for, for the uh, for the community as well. Um, unfortunately, what came out of that meeting um, was that Mass Housing issued a letter the next day that uh, we received on Wednesday morning, indicating that in their view, the changes were not substantial and that the concerns should be addressed at the local level before the ZBA. So it's, it's back at the ZBA. Um, we took it as far as we could. Um, I, I don't agree with the determination, but to accept it and you move on. Um, and I just wanna point out that tomorrow night, the ZBA will be continuing their public hearing on the Mugar site. It's at 6.30, um, an earlier start. And right now it's the last scheduled date, although they have until April 9th to continue their hearing. So I wanna thank um, the members of the board for, for um, all of the additional work that uh, has been done on, on the Mugar site. And I wanna thank the chairman for scheduling meetings and for attending meetings and, and, and for uh, leading us over these last few weeks on this issue. Thank you. Ms. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I just want to um, note the passing of Elaine Shea today. Uh, she had pancreatic cancer and uh, I mean, everyone's loss is important in uh, this one. Um, is no more important, except that I um, am so grateful uh, to Ms. Jay. I, um, I recently met her uh, uh, and uh, I, she just welcomed me. Uh, she was just so welcoming and so helpful uh, and, and, um, and her family too. And she reminded me of a lot of the people who helped my mom um, uh, when I was growing up. Uh, and it was through that help that I was able to get a good education and, and um, become a better person. And, and, and so um, uh, I, um, that's it. You know, she was really a wonderful person. And I just wanted to note that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. That is very sad news indeed, Lynn. I hadn't heard that. She and her husband were uh, real assets to the town. That's very, that's, I'm very sad to hear that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yep, Ms. Shea was 
Def definitely a matriarch of the town. She uh, promoted everyone being upstanders, as I think everyone that met her recently. She got you got a nice purple bracelet, so we, we wear those in commemoration of her work. Um, I did want to just follow up on what Mr. DeCorsi said. Um, he was very diplomatic in the way he described the conversation, but there was a lot. I, I want to thank Mr. DeCorsi and Senator Freeman for the advocacy on the call. I think um, both I and particularly Mr. DeCorsi and Senator Freeman all were very active in trying to convince mass housing about our position um but we weren't successful in the end but you know we did it wasn't without a fight and uh i certainly never want to find myself on the opposite end of a conversation with senator friedman because she she, she knows how to argue um and then i also just following up on that i had sp spoken with the town manager today we, we did have a resident meeting in the past few days and one of the issues in it, separate from the project was just some of the accumulation of trash. We've asked the MUGARs to participate at this point. You know, we're still in process of trying to reach out to the MUGARs, but not hopeful that they're gonna step up to the plate. So I, next week we'll have an agenda item on this just to discuss what the plan is to clean up the area. Um, and Tom manager is already working on that. And one last thing, as we move to April 5th, a date that many of us school parents have been looking forward to for a long, long time, I do want to thank our colleagues on the school committee and everyone in the school department for all the work that they've done this year to continue to pro provide really top-notch education for Arlington students in this crazy system that we've had to operate under. Um, and, you know, my boys are both in hybrid programs and it hasn't been easy. I know for parents, it hasn't been easy for teachers and administrators, but everyone's doing the best they can. And it was really the best result of a bad situation. So I do want to thank them as we transition back into full-time, hopefully full-time for an extended period of time. So with that, I will take a motion to Adjourn. Was it to adjourn? Second. All right. Attorney Hay. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. Good night, folks. Thanks. Good night. Good meeting.